Well, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining in. Uh, we have uh, Srisha and Mark here, um, and they are, they are the customer success experts. So I will let them take it away. You have a bunch of portfolio companies from across, uh, across the spectrum here. So maybe um, we we'll do a round of introductions, round of introductions and, and take it away from there. I, uh, I will not try to be here and disrupt anything. So I'll, I'll get going, get my coffee, but um, please feel free to carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Srisha. Sure. So uh, let me start uh, with my introduction. So Srisha Ramda, CEO of Strike Deck. Uh, I've been a startup guy for some time. Uh, I did a company called Leadformix that was a marketing automation platform. Uh, that was uh, that I sold to Calidus Cloud in 2012. I was with Calidus for two, uh, for two years, first two years as a general manager of the marketing cloud. Then uh, one year I did m and for Calidus. I acquired the company, um, uh, we acquired a company in London called Click Tools and uh, in Bay Area called Genius. And before Leadformix, I was in the early team of uh, Yodli, which was a FinTech company uh, back in 1999-2000. So uh, my current venture, Strike Deck, it's a customer success platform uh, focused on uh, three business outcomes, retention, expansion, and advocacy. And uh, we've been uh, working with uh, customers to deliver customer success. And uh, I'll let Mark introduce himself as well. <clears throat> so Mark Pecoraro, um, currently in between permanent things. Uh, my whole career has been in uh, post-sales, B2B, you know, high value, relatively high touch uh, scenarios. Started my career at Sybase, was early on at the first version of Success Factors with a tech company that um, uh, had a life before its, its current life. Uh, went on to Commerce One where I ran worldwide support. That was another Canaan portfolio company. And I've since done uh, a handful of uh, SaaS companies, once again, B2B, and really have been uh, deep into the customer success kind of discipline and principles and kind of a thought leader, doing a lot of blogging, working with a couple companies uh, for technology that, that support the discipline. So currently uh, working with small startups, helping them on a consulting basis with various uh, customer success efforts, um, and glad to be here. Okay. So here's what we uh, plan to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about why customer success is a secret of the hyper growth. Why customer success? I'm going to share a couple of case studies of companies that have been doing customer success well. Uh, we're going to talk about customer success growth hacking. Early startups, how do you do customer success without customer success team? Talk about customer success based on life cycle. Mark is going to share uh, customer success best practices that includes feedback, playbooks, segmentation, onboarding, QBR, metrics, <laughs> customer success organization, you know, staffing, when to hire a leader, compensation, reporting, collaboration with other functions. He's also going to talk about tools. Now, along with the, with the, should we do a quick intro so we know who's on the phone oh, yeah. as well? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, We'll start the introductions as well. But before that, I have, um, I actually have a folder. Let me pull that up. And I'm going to share with, with everybody who's, who's, uh, who's participating in the workshop. But before that, let's start with, with the introductions. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Candice, and I work at Zugata. And uh, we're a startup in Palo Alto. And we focus on um, performance management and really um, how to create more of a feedback culture at workplaces. So um, I'm a community manager, so my focus is customer success as well as product and a lot of other um, pieces at Zubat. Right. Do we have a customer success team? You know. This is our team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, along with the CEO, we work really closely together on all of our customer issues. Got it. How many customers do you have? Um, right now, I think we have um, we have 16 as far as our enterprise, and then right. we have the free version, and we have um, uh, over 800 people signed up. Oh, great! 800 companies. So I'm a customer success manager over at Zigata, and Candice's description is wonderful. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> great. 
Many theories at Umber Health. Um, we take medical imaging and move it to the cloud. Uh, I run marketing there for about 55 people total, mostly human company. Um, number of customers right now is, well, we look at it in terms of number of providers that are exchanging imaging on our platform, and that's at about 750. Um, don't have a customer success team yet, but it's probably something by the end of the year, if you ask me, that'll be a different answer. Right, right. It's uh, great to see marketing participate in the customer success workshop. Yesterday we had actually an event yeah. where we talked about marketing and customer success. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And no street shop from past lives. Yeah. Lots of past past. Yeah, great to meet you again. Mm -hmm. Can we have uh, introductions? Uh, folks who have joined on the phone. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Casey. Hi, hi, I'm Kasha. Um, I lead growth and operations of In Common. We're also based in Palo Alto. <laughs> um, and we, we're the first talent marketplace which predicts a candidate's success at any company and role. And we just launched in beta. So we're starting to see customers from both the candidate side and the recruiter side or the company side. Uh, so. We're thinking about customer success for both sides of that marketplace. So very exciting. Right. I love marketplaces. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hey, this is, uh, this is Brad from Emissary. We're actually out on the East Coast out of New York City. Uh, we're a portfolio company uh, focused on putting sales reps into a conversation with someone that used to work at the organization they're selling into. So we're a customer success team of uh, four right now and looking to grow. Great, great to meet Brad. Um, I'm Liz, uh, Brad's colleague, uh, also dialing from Emissary in New York City. Uh, like Brad said, we're a marketplace to uh, connect uh, sellers to advisors who uh, used to work at companies they're trying to sell into. So a lot of our success is uh, around sales coaching. Great. Hey everyone, it's Mike. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you, Mike. Excellent. You, you have myself and Caroline Stewart from CompStack. We're the customer success team here. Uh, we're focused on commercial real estate. Great. So is it again a marketplace where you are connecting with agents and customers or is it just focused on real estate uh, professionals? So what we're doing is we are, we have two sides of the platform. So we're focused on selling the data to uh, lenders, to banks, to, to owners of commercial real estate. We have another side of the house that really focuses on collecting the data uh, and, and making sure that it's uh, what our client's looking for. Got it. Great. Great to meet Mike. Are we done? Do we have... Anyone else? Okay, good. So we'll get started. So I was uh, talking about the folder that I'm gonna share with all the participants. So this has got a uh, number of things that both Mark and I hope uh, will prove to be uh, good takeaways. So we have a Zoom uh, case study of how Zoom has done uh, customer success, we are already on the Zoom video right now. I uh, think they have done a, an incredible job with their customer success. In fact, uh, you know, uh, Jedi did, a, did an interview of Eric Luan from Zoom that I would definitely recommend everybody to watch this video. Um, and then we have, I have an article that talks about the right customer at the right time. And then I have a snap survey from template that basically is one question surveys. It's not NPS, but it's one question surveys that you can administer to your customer base, depending on where they are in their customer journey. So part it will be useful for everybody. Uh, since we have early startups as well, I have, we have a SaaS metric spreadsheet that you can plug in your customer success number, budget, all of that, and hopefully it will help you uh, visualize your growth got a few S1 analysis of few companies and how they have gone about their customer success and what it has done to their bottom line. 
we've got playbook template. So uh, the term that has gone mainstream in customer success is uh, playbook. Uh, so we've got a list of playbooks. You know, there's a customer term. What's the playbook you follow? If there's a there's a, a customer who is uh, willing to uh, be a strong advocate, how do you go about that scenario? So we've got playbooks for different scenarios. Then the the next document is how to think about customer health model. So uh, again, one of the terms that has gone mainstream is customer health score. So you do surveys, surveys is lagging indicator. How can you get a leading indicator that's predictive of customer health? So you have to come up with customer health score. So there's a methodology that will help you decide the customer health score. I've got uh, the, the PowerPoint template that we're gonna do uh, use for this workshop. That's the PDF here. Then there's customer success KPI. So all the KPIs, metrics that you can think about customer success, it's a document on that. Uh, customer success process template. So all the process forms that you can use for sales, uh, customer success, handoff, all of those uh, kinds of process, uh, got a template for that. And then the last document is around the compensation model of the customer success team. So hopefully these uh, set of documents uh, will prove to be you know, of uh, use for you guys. So let's get started. Uh, so before uh, talk about the secret of customer success hyper growth, I've got one question. Uh, my question is, what's an ideal product? Any? It depends on the customer. That's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday, I, I heard an interesting answer to this question. An ideal product is one that doesn't need any sales, any marketing, any support, any customer success. Right? But in in actual scenario, in practical scenario, you know, you need all these functions, right? So, uh, so, so what, you know, the, the companies in, in recent times have realized that if they do customer success well, the growth will happen automatically. So because of that, it's interesting how quickly customer success has gone mainstream. If you go to LinkedIn and look at the job growth, you'll find the curve going up. That shows you know, how fast every startup is adopting customer success. And if you look at the traditional funnel, you know, uh, people always think about it as the, the funnel as a representative of customer acquisition. And there's an obsession around new logo acquisition because everybody talks about that. But if you look at the funnel, the way we, I have shown it is uh, retention, referral, revenue, right? How to monetize your existing customer base. That's all customer success, right? So you, you have sales bringing in acquisition, you activate, then there's retention, referral, and revenue. Right? That's all customer success. And just to highlight you know, how important is customer success? I want to go, uh, take you through a few companies, a few examples of how they are doing. One is MuleSoft, uh, recent IPO, right? And if you look at the, the data, their subscription revenue is about 150 million. Their total revenue is 200 million. Their subscription revenue is 150 million. Professional services revenue is 35 million. And their growth in 2016 was 91%. In, uh, sorry, in 2015 was 91%, 16, it was 71%. And if you look at the, the revenue numbers, what you will find impressive is that dollar retention has gone up from 110 to 117%. So they are able to take their existing install base and put more revenue out of that. And that can only happen if you are successful in making customers successful, right? If you look at another example, uh, Atlassian, it's even impressive. Atlassian uh, did have sales team for a long time. It was 
you know, I consider Ecclesian as a classic example where it was a customer success that was driving the revenue growth, right? 100 million in sales with no sales people. So it was all about customers going to the website, using the product, and becoming successful at using the product, right? So it was success, customer success that was fueling the growth. So why customer success? Very simple, if you look at this graph, that will basically help you understand that a small percentage shift in the churn numbers can have a big impact in the, in the growth. The one, uh, again, one term that's now universally recognized is negative churn. So negative churn is when your churn, uh, when, you're, when you're actually getting, uh, when you're offsetting the customers who have churned with upsell and cross sell. So that's again uh, all about how can you get more from your customer base? Uh, how can, if they are successful in using your, is using your product, then they will, uh, they will go and procure more user licenses, they adopt different products. So one key message that you know, we want to talk about is don't wait to hire customer success. You know, uh, in fact, few of the folks these days are advocating before even you hire sales people, hire customer success. You know, uh, I was referring to Zoom. The Zoom, uh, again, uh, you will, when Eric was chatting with Jerry, Eric's main message was uh, that they think uh, higher marketing, but they hired customer success folks before to make their customers uh, successful. So customer success without a team. This is this, uh, again a marketing term that has become popular called growth hacking. And growth hacking has essentially two components to it. One is how do you adopt unconventional tactics to acquire new customers. But the second uh, main theme in growth hacking is how do you make your customers so successful that they start referring other users, other customers, right? So customer success, I think, is a central theme of growth hacking. And, you know, early startups can start adopting customer success even without having a team you know so just like they used to say that everybody is in sales in an organization the new mantra is everybody is in customer success right and so how do you do customer success without team so here are a few tactics that talk about how do you do how do you growth hack customer success right so it's all about building a minimum viable product, iterate and improve, right? Put user experience at the forefront, produce a lot of uh, quality content that can be consumed by your customers, users, right? To better use the product. If you, I, I was talking about Zoom, right? The, the video service. If you go to, if you log into Zoom, you will find the button right there in the front, get training. Right, so one click and you get trade, right? So that's a central thing. And then on the product front, think about what's that, what are those um, key points that will enhance the customer experience? You know, traditionally, all the web conferencing software that you use, like WebEx, you need to log into the WebEx portal, create a new entry to set up a new meeting. Right, with Zoom, if you download their um, Firefox plugin, right, then you can be in your Google Calendar, and when you're setting up, setting up a meeting, then again you will see a, a set it, set it as a Zoom meeting button that you click, that will set up that will give you that um, the code that you can uh, put it on the on the calendar invite, and that will automatically create an entry. In, um, in the Zoom. And so that enhances the, the user experience. So just to 
showcase as an example what I'm talking about. I'm going to create a new entry. And I have this button here, make, make it a Zoom meeting. The moment I, you know, click this, let's say, it will provide this key here. But what's important is that this will get registered automatically in the Zoom online portal, right? So it saves me uh, multiple steps, right? So that's user experience. So Zoom did this really well, and, and that was their growth hacking, the customer success. So they leverage their own software, you know, to talk almost every day with their initial customers, right? Focusing on what are those features that will add to their convenience. So any, any questions so far? Any question on uh, customer success as a growth hacking? Who's in, who's in that mode now? Um, well, we are, we don't have a customer success team yet, but we run it more through between marketing and, and sales. So, um, yeah. So uh, definitely a big part of it. I work with most of our top customers, so they get executive touch pretty heavily um, services team as well. Right. So for the, for the startups that do not have customer success uh, function yet, you know, anybody wants to share any experience on how you guys are looking at customer success right now? Any examples of growth hacking? Mini, how do you go about uh, you know, getting customer advocacy as a part of marketing. Yeah, sure. Um, two different vehicles. So uh, one thing we started was uh, at any of the trade shows and events we're at. So we deal with physicians, right? So right. these folks are pretty busy day to day. Our sales team always complains, like you'll book a, a meeting with them and people will just not show up and not even tell you because guess what? They got called it the OR. So you can't really argue with that. Um, so what we try to do is leverage any trade show or conference that we're at with them because then they're away from the hospital and they have more dedicated time. So we've started a series of um, kind of small uh, dinner series that's really meant to be um, a, a, a conversation about what's going on, what's top of mind for them. So we use that as, as one of the feedback loops. Um, we rebranded last year. So before that, we did a big outreach and really did kind of a deep user study as well and right. asked them about a lot of different things, but also how do they feel about our old name? And that was one of the key reasons why we rebranded um, was based on their feedback. So we have, you know, I guess for us, it's more conversations. Um, there's the the customers we do have a customer support team and that we look at you know what's coming in in terms of issues from a, so from a product feedback perspective uh more of like the little things that are that can shave off minutes here and there all add up um yeah. and i mean i think so from our perspective there's there's one analyst firm that kind of monitors customer sentiment um right. and we've been fortunate to to win that category for image exchange the last three years running now. So I think even though we're small, it's, you know, we're up against the likes of like GE Healthcare. So right. uh, definitely what we bring to the table is that high touch. That's right. Great. That's our biggest leverage. Great. So Stripe Deck itself is a startup, small startup. We've got about 25 customers. One thing we have uh, done in this regard is to form a customer advocacy board even right now right so it's a small set of customers but we formed a customer advocacy board we have uh, you know we get a bunch of customers together we invite uh, customer success folks from other companies to come who are not even a customer but to come and share details on what they are doing and and we uh, look at best practices and Try to encourage people to adopt best practices. So, don't wait for um, you know for your 
company startup to become big to form form a um, advisory board. Yeah, that's really what we do through those right. editors I mentioned that they are in essence our advisory board. Right. Mm -hmm. awesome. Can I ask a couple of questions? Sure. At these points. Um, so we're in the phase now of trying to just produce as much content as possible, but also given limited bandwidth, we don't. Also, we just want to make it, and then no one will come and view it. And so I'm, I'm curious um, how you, um, how you guys think about how to prioritize what is going to be most effective, and also putting it in front of the user when they need it. I mean, we're we just started using intercom, and so might leverage that um, within our app to mm -hmm. like make sure it come pops up when needed. But I'm curious if there are other best practices there. So I think a you know, piece of it is understanding kind of the customer journey and what you need when. Yeah. And um, a lot of times that just kind of happens and you do onboarding, but it's key to figure out, yeah, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more details, you know, what, what are your current points in, in, or points of friction that slow down the onboarding, mm -hmm. right? Do you need high touch intervention to get through that friction? So if it's a product efficiency and the only way to get around it is a CSM, that might work while you're small, but if you're in hyper growth, that's going to break, right? Um, yeah, the flip side of that high touch is having, a, a, you know, broadly a customer community portal, which you can do a million things on, right? And that can tie back, you know, for easy access from the product. So, you know, your help sort of thing can take them into where the content is. Um, but I think it, it, it at the highest levels, you know, what's your customer journey, what are your touch points, what are their success points, and then, you know, from there you can kind of map how that content, you want the content to be proactively helping them. Yeah. Um, now, reactively, you know, it, it helps to deflect support, you know, help the knowledge bases and that sort of stuff. But ideally, that content you're producing, you want it to kind of be just in time to the right people at the right place, right? And Intercom can do that in terms of understanding user patterns and you know, when to fire off an email or you know, when to say, hey, we have some new features you should check out. We did a release last Friday, um, you know, but it, it depends on your customer journey. So that's really, if you don't understand that, then you're just throwing darts at the wall with intuition. And it's not that you can get it wrong, but there's not a master plan. So on the content side, I would uh, definitely advocate engaging a content consulting person. That I think investment will go a long way, right? Second is, uh, as Mark pointed out, focus on the onboarding piece in terms of what content you need to uh, prepare. So focus on what are the implementation issues, right? How can uh, those implementation issues be solved? Uh, how does a customer get their first value? So focus on content on that. And then, uh, you know, as you onboard more customers, then you can produce more content on the other areas. But focus on the initial onboarding fees, the first value. Any other questions? Okay. So this graph, I think, is an is an interesting on the customer success model that you should think about depending on the customer company life cycle. So, you know, uh, last few years there has been a lot of talk about marketing and sales alignment, right? So, uh, marketing always complains that sales do not follow up on the leads, and sales always talk about they're not they're not getting good leads, right? This is a, this is the marketing sales alignment. There is now a, a new alignment problem, which is customer success and sales. So I've heard customer success folks complaining that sales is not bringing the right type of customers. And, and sales is saying, you know, we, we, we are getting in, you know, all the folks who are willing to come in, right? So this one talks about what kind of customers you should go after it in what phase of your business, right? So you need initially, you need all those customers who are willing to come on board, right? So get them in so that you can understand the pattern of the, of the usage of the product, right? Next, you should get in those folks who are forgiving, right? They're willing to, uh, to be, uh, they're willing to, uh, willing to carry on even though there are a few bucks in the product, right? So they have, you need forgiving. Then you need folks who, you know, if they're all use cases are met, 
right? They are ready to refer you to other customers. You want them to go viral, right? And then the next phase, you try to find all those, uh, the key customer segments that can be valuable for your business. And then you start focusing on those customer segments that are profitable for you. Does this model resonate uh, in some ways where you know, the early phase you want customers who are willing to give you time, right? In the early phase, they should volunteer their time so that you can understand their motivations, their use cases, and so that you can iterate on the product. Then you need customers who, who are ready to overlook a few of the issues, a few of the bugs, and, and they are uh, they are not the product. Now, the ones you fire later. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They're the ones who are looking. I mean, usually pricing. You can map pricing to that scale pretty easily. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, you know, but this that this last segment, profitable thing. So that's when you start firing customers. You figure out, you know, who are the customers who keep uh, filing in complaints, talk about issues, who knock your advocates and who are not contributing, you're just supporting these customers is super expensive. Right? That's when you take tough decisions. Okay, so if we uh, map a com company life cycle, we can look at early stage, talk about less than 10 million in revenue. Your key objective is adoption, adoption, adoption. Right? That's the only thing that you should be concerned about. How can we drive adoption? Look at the usage, right? Usage patterns. So what are the tactics that you should employ when it comes to customer success? You should think about customer personas, figure out the customer journey map, right? Start thinking a little bit about the segmentation, right? Don't go deep into it, but just, just start thinking about the early adopters and, and so on, right? And then start thinking about playbook, right? If there's a customer who's super happy, how am I going to leverage that? Can I get case studies? Can I do video shoots? Right? Can I take the testimonial and put that on the website? If there's a customer who's unhappy, you know, what what's the kind of roadmap that I can present? And then over invest in the care of customers. Sorry, can I add one thing to that? Sure. That goes back to your alignment point. Um, before you start personas, I would say the first thing to start with is defining your ICP or ideal customer profile because right. you could define personas till the cows come home, but right. if you mm -hmm. don't have alignment on who that really should be, right. then you waste your time. So right. yeah. that's where you get sales to sign off, you get marketing, you know, all, all the functions should really sign off on the ICP right. and it becomes part of your company DNA, right. and then those things line up a lot easier. Well, that's a great point. I you know, completely echo that, you know, sales, marketing, customer success, all should align that's in right. terms of personas. Mid-stage, we're now starting to focus on scaling, and this is where the key objective becomes retention. And the tactics that you can deploy is operationalizing the process. So now you need to adopt processes. You know, you need to start thinking about staffing your customer success team, get deeper into segmentation playbook mapping, start thinking about metrics. Again, don't go deep into metrics, but, but start thinking about what metrics you can present to the CFO, like what metrics you can present to the CEO what metrics you can present to marketing, what metrics you can present to sales. And then start formalizing the advocacy and upsell programs. And later stage that's greater than 50 million, now your key objectives is advocacy at scale. And this is where your tactics would be user community, annual conferences, local meetups. You have specialized team now within customer success. There's a team that's focused on just onboarding. There'll be an adoption team 
little bit of training the separately that's responsible. In early teams, you know, you have journalists, right, who basically are doing onboarding, are responsible for adoption, and are training on the product. Again, segmentation and playbook mapping, you would deeper into that. And it's important to operationalize benchmarks at this time. You have a formal advisory board advising you, right? By benchmark, you can say, here's how our successful customers are using the product. And you are in the bottom 10%, here are 10 tactics that can help you improve. So benchmarks go a long way in institutionalizing you know, customer success. I have a question um, about this slide, actually. So for the tactics, you mentioned user community, annual conferences, local meetups as the first tactic here. Uh, for a business which is growing, like for, for example, for a marketplace, um, it, as we you know, try to get adoption in an area, because we're launching by region, um, is there a reason like why you wouldn't recommend using something like a tactic like that earlier stage? Because we're obviously very early in our, we're very early stage, but um, trying to build up like that local community of users, let's say on either side, like we have candidates and companies is something that we're thinking about employing in the next few months. So why is this more of like a later stage tactic is my question. Yeah, the later stage, you just get the benefit of numbers, right? So that's why your user community is, is larger community. You can have uh, user communities specific to uh, local areas. You know, every city has got a user community, right? So, for example, today, if you look at Marketo, right, they have uh, Seattle user community. They have San Jose user community, San Francisco user community. When you're smaller, you can still think about user community, but think about it in a, in a slightly different way. You basically have ambassadors. Uh, Evernote, as an example, when they started, they started uh, designating few of their power users as ambassadors. They were Evernote ambassadors, right? So there was a, there was a cook who was an Evernote ambassador who was talking about how he's storing all his recipes in Evernote. Right, and he was telling to everybody else, all the other chef, you know, how they can leverage uh, Evernote. Right, so you know, potentially you can think about you know having ambassadors who represent your product with the community. That way, you know, potentially you can get started that way. Yeah, the, the look, yes. I mean, so typically every company you end up having a nexus where you're headquartered. Um, we're actually here sure. in New York, but we have strong nexus there as well as in Boston area, so New England. Um, and we do seminar series in those cities in particular because we know we have enough bodies to make a local meetup beneficial to them. Um, so we run it with some cocktails and they get to come, and we usually have like a couple of featured speakers um, and then networking. So you can, I would say, and we're less than 10, 10 million at the moment. So. I would say you can employ it earlier if it makes sense. Like you said, it's really about the numbers. Right. So you have to look at where you have the gathering of people and where it makes sense. Yeah, I think from a practical perspective, from my experience having been in small companies under 10 million and above, um, all of these things are actually applicable from day one. The question is, is what context, you know, when you're a tiny company and you know every single customer intimately, you know, you can still create a sense of community and uh, advocacy and have your dinners and, you know, whatever. It's just when you're 50 million and above, that is a big structured program that takes a leader and has a lot more to it. So really all of these things in reality are on your tool bench to do. And it's up to kind of the CS leader, the rest of the exec team to say, okay, for our business, because every business has its own DNA, it's just like a human being, you know, what makes sense, you know, for us. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. All right, now we get into how to operationalize customer success. So um, let me kind of kick it off with um, you know where where my information kind of or stories come from. Um, you know, I, in my introduction, I kind of gave you a quick uh, overview of if, where what led me into customer success. 
Um, most, well, all of my experience has been in venture funded startups. Um, yeah, and this is customer success specific. I was, you know, employee six at Success Factors. I was an employee ten at Accept Software, and that was it, it, Accept Software was about a decade ago, and so that was ground floor seed funding. You know, but we got to about ten million, and, and the company faltered. Um, most of what I've done in the last five years is, um, you know, very high, relatively high touch, very high ASPs, B two B sort of solutions, white hat security. Um, App Accelerator, which was mobile development, um, uh, Sosta, which is a Canaan company, uh, does uh, performance management of web uh, revenue generating websites, and then most recently Conviva, which was uh, video analytics. So, some of what I'm going to share with you are stories that are specific to some of those those companies. Um, I'll keep the company name out if it's not a good or flattering story. But frankly, you know, as most of you know, you kind of learn a lot from adverse situations. Um, and so I just want to paint that sort of framework as I talk through it. And I want it to be interactive because you guys all are in uh, different challenges. And as I said before, every company has its own um, sort of DNA. So customer success, although we're trying to create some frameworks and templates and standards, it's no different than your marketing, your sales, where you have to really understand your marketplace to figure out the right approach to be successful ultimately. So um, I'll go back to Accept Software, which was a, um, a decision support application that uh, in layman's terms, just uh, automated product management. Okay, So it took everything from where in my product portfolio should I allocate my money, down to roadmaps and releases, and it was get rid of Excel for the product managers, have them use Accept software, and then they would create their agile sprints. So that was it in a nutshell. We went out in 2007 to get funding and uh, found out the VC community was already very focused on the SaaS business model. So we couldn't get funding unless we actually swapped to be a true SaaS player. So no more hybrid, we'll, we'll sell you the software, but we'll host it, right? And so that's where I, um, uh, I really got um, immersed in the subscription economy and what it meant to, um, I should probably stand over here given how the camera is working. Um, the subscription economy and what it meant to be in kind of a recurring service model. So one of the, one of the first um, kind of aha moments I had kind of circa 2008, 2009 um, was my, my uh, lead sales guy, Bill, came into my office one September and said, hey, Symantec's coming up for renewal in November. It's $350,000, $400,000. How are they doing? Like if I give him a call, am I going to get slapped in the face or am I going to have a good discussion and get some money out of him? I said, well, I don't know. Let me check. So at that point in time, because we were switching to be a full true enterprise SaaS player, security, redundancy, 24 by 7, I had two sets of responsibilities. One is I had all your traditional stuff, support, and professional services and training and onboarding and all that good stuff. But I also ran the operations, so I had to build out the data center and all that entailed that. But, you know, I viewed that as a service element too, because if you come up and the website's slow or it's not there or it doesn't work or it's insecure, you know, it's the second S in SaaS, which is service, not the software, it's the service, right? So I had access to all this data. So I said, Bill, I'll get back to you in 30 minutes. So I looked at cases, you know, tech support cases. Um, I looked at the bugs they had called in. I looked at feature requests. Um, I had my support guys extract usage data every Saturday night into a CSV file, and I imported that into a Tableau desktop thing so I could see unique logins, total logins. Um, uh, requirements were kind of the source or the, the key piece of data in the system, right? So are you adding new requirements? Are you updating requirements? So I was able to graph all that out. Um, I saw a new relic. I could see their... Uh, end user performance, their uptime, the whole bit. So I went through all this sort of stuff and in my head filtered through it and said, you know, based on all this data, I think the customer's pretty healthy. That's my assessment. So I went back to Bill and said, you know, looks healthy. Long story short, he went in, got the renewal, all was good. Um, repeated that exercise for a new CEO, but I did it for every single customer. 
and it was a six hour exercise. And the problem was at the end of the day, that huge Excel spreadsheet that we literally pasted on the wall with all the red, yellow, and, and green was out of date because it's all manual. So it led me to this concept of a 360 degree view of the customer. And it really doesn't exist unless you have a CS platform. It doesn't exist in any single system. You know, your Salesforce has a lot of stuff, but it's not everything. You got usage data, right? And so um, as a CSM, uh, I want, you know, my vision was to have this cockpit, right? And I know where my destination is, which is, you know, customer being successful. Um, and we'll drill down on that. But I want to know all the, the, the things that are coming up, you know? And so I got, my plan was when we got funding, I was going to create a data warehouse and start to do this. I wasn't as entrepreneurial as Sharisha and, and think, hey, I'll go start a company at that point. Um, but that was the plan. Uh, and that plan failed because we didn't get the funding. Uh, but that's where I got involved with uh, a couple other CS platform companies because this concept of having a 360 degree view of the cust customer is just critical. It's the only way you're going to be able to map out their journey, be data driven, uh, have an early warning system for problems, right? Uh, and also, really, what you want to measure is not just the problems that are coming up, but are they being successful? Um, so, through my journey in you know, a variety of you know, companies much like yours, um, you know, venture funded, you know, 100 people or less, et cetera. I found there's a couple of prerequisites to customer success succeeding at a company. And the, very, the number one thing is, is the leadership within the company and it's the CEO. Um, most of my stories for customer success is an absolute train wreck. The CEO was completely disconnected from customer success, what it is, what it meant. When you talk about Zoom, when you talk about Zorora, when you talk about success factors, um, one common element, even though all those businesses are different, is if you watch a CEO speak at conferences, which I do regularly, they don't talk about strategy and competition. They talk about customer success. That's what they talk about. So I'm, it's so if, when you're in a real small organization, but it counts as companies scale up, I found that's, that's the very, very first question I ask when I'm looking at a company and evaluating, you know, is customer success, you know, what does it get to take to be successful? The, the second most important thing, and we kind of validated this last night with a, a venture capitalist from foundation who is getting his experience from the board. Like, you know, when you go to board meetings, what's, you know, what are the topics that are on your mind? And he said, uh, product is the second most important executive in the company. Because you talk about the most important, or the, I forget the, the exact uh, acronym and words you use, but it's like, what's the ideal customer? Well, you know, part of that starts with, do we understand our marketplace and we building the right product for the marketplace? And, um, you know, if, if you've done that sort of homework, then, you know, you have a, a great start at aligning with who your customers are and how to, how to tackle that journey. However, um, I've learned the hard way that products that don't install, adopt, give value quickly, um, they're not user friendly. I mean, name your set of problems. Um, then your efforts in CS are largely or partially going to be um, you know, filling those gaps and you cannot throw bodies at product efficiencies. You just can't do it. Um, there's a lot we'll talk about. Um, we can pop through this slide because we're going to talk about metrics and journey, but those, you know, those are really key elements. Um, the other thing is, you know, what is customer success, right? So it's not a moniker for services and software companies of what we used to do in the old product world. It is not. Right, the product world was sell a big perpetual pile of software for a huge amount of money and then throw bodies, professional services, training, implementation, whatever, um, and then get your 15% maintenance. And there was all kinds of nuances in there depending on your company. But customer success isn't just a new paint job for those old functions. It's a uh, it morphs out of many of those functions. But as you guys well know, 
you know, it's, it's become part of most SaaS companies business model, right? Just like sales is part of a business model, just like finance, just like engineering, like you wouldn't question that if you were starting a software company tomorrow, but many companies don't from the get go say what's customer success and what's that going to mean to us. They wait until a certain point when they're uh, quote unquote ready. And it's interesting to understand, you know, what that definition of ready is, right? Because you're really ready the second you get your first customer. Um, so I, I kind of define it as it's helping your customers realize measurable success with your products and services and it's throughout their journey, right? So, you know, no secret recurring uh, or the, the, the subscription world is an on, ongoing journey. So this is not a get them implemented fast and sort of uh, get through them. We'll talk about some metrics um, and we've talked about life cycle. And so it's really about getting customers to value quickly and, and sticking with them throughout their life cycle. Um, we saw a talk, or I saw a talk from Lincoln Murphy about two weeks ago, and he's like as one of just the premier thought leaders in customer success. And he really, he had a similar definition, but he, he really turned it a little bit from a customer perspective and said, it's really all about the customer's desired outcomes, okay? They bought you for a reason, right? What's that desired outcome? And, how they get through the interactions with your company to get through that desired outcome. Because all, you know, the, the sales kind of the beginning of the relationship. Skip through that. Um, so I'm gonna just talk about a handful of things that I find, you know, really critical, uh, having been in startups, you know, small to medium size uh, and best practices um, and we'll dive into some of this in detail, but a lot of customer success comes from the support world, right? Everybody has support. Generally, when you get a customer, there's somebody responsible for answering the phone, answering the tickets, what have you. Um, and so that support function, I believe, is a critical part of customer success. And it has to be rock solid. Because if support's a mess, which includes being a buggy product that has a lot of problems, so I kind of bundle that together, um, you know, your, your field people who are trying to be proactive with your customer are gonna be carrying the, the fire extinguishers, right? So support has to be there, it has to be just, it's almost table stakes, it has to be really good. Um, uh, that break fix function doesn't go away, but you don't want that with your CSMs. Uh, we talked about the 360 degree view, but once you have that, think of the reporting you can do off of that, both to your executives in terms of, here's our portfolio of customers, here's customers that are in various degrees of health, various degrees of risks, you know, um, Sharisha said it, you know, we all used to be in sales and now we're all in customer success. And I view, you know, back to my leadership comments, customer success is not just a function with a leader with these CSMs doing activities. Um, above that, it's a philosophy, it's a mentality, and once again, it starts with the CEO. And if that's in place, everybody, product, marketing, sales, DevOps, engineering support, everybody needs to understand your customer base. So that 360 degree view isn't just the cockpit to the CSM, it becomes the dashboard uh, for everybody. Uh, customer segmentation, right? Um, I've been mostly in higher touch uh, sort of situations, but I'm working with a company now who has 2,500 customers paying a small amount and they anticipate a doubling of that customer base within six months. Well, how do you deal with that, right? Um, customer life cycle journey mapping, and a lot comes out of that. We'll talk about some of this in detail. But if you don't know the, the journey your customer is going down and what the critical pivot points are, it would be akin using my, my cockpit analogy to, you know, saying, hey, I'm going to fly from San Francisco to Hong Kong and I'm not going to have a flight plan. I'll just wing it. And hopefully I don't get too off course and not have enough gas to get back on course. Um, so you got to understand all that. And then also voice of the customer. You know, what is your survey input strategy? How do you bring that all back? So uh, talk, just drill down on some of those topics. You know, one is, um, you know, by understanding the customer journey, and this gets back to the comment on um, content is, you know, you don't want to get too granular, but you don't want to keep it 
too high level. I've, I've kept it kind of high level here, just for example. But you know, you sell the customer, right? You transition them from sales to the CSM, and that's the opportunity for expectation setting, uh, for the implementation. You know, you've got this onboarding piece that could be a flip of a switch, it could be an email, or it can be a six week project of development stuff and integration, right? And so um, understanding all those points uh, it's really critical. I believe in some of the materials Sharisha has uh, put in that folder, there's some, um, there's some areas here. So, you know, my suggestion is, you know, keep it not too complicated because as you, you know, I'm a firm believer in come out with V1 quickly and intelligently. It's not going to be perfect and that's okay. And then iterate because if you sit down with your team and say, Hey, let's map out the customer journey and you get too analytical and too granular, you'll never get there. And the truth of the matter is, is every customer journey is a little different. So you have to really bring it up to the abstract so you can then define how do I interact, where are the friction points, what, what can you do? Uh, we talked about this a little, you know, I'm, it's all about transparency. So I, I find that uh, the more I can help everybody in the company as a customer success executive understand the customer's journey, the more I have everybody kind of rowing in the same direction I am. You know, it's all our same customers. It's all our same revenue. We all have the same stock price. Um, so it ensures, it ensures alignment. So my last company, I did a health report on customers. I segregated the customers at risk and why. Uh, I gave them the NPS scores and what had changed over previous weeks. Um, and it's sometimes it's really good news and sometimes it's bad news, but it doesn't matter. If it's bad news, you know, you need to do something about it. Ignoring it's only going to make the fire uh, get bigger. Um, I talked about early warning systems. Um, generally, when I talk to people about the customer journey, you know, I say, give me your, your flagship customer. That's just awesome. Like what happened? What transpired? And what about that? Do we want to have transpire uh, again? And that's going to be different when you're a small company. Uh, you're, you can be intimate with everyone, know every executive. As you get bigger, that becomes diff more difficult. But regardless, you all have a story in your company about a customer that had a great journey and experience and one where you hit some sort of stumbling blocks, right? And so what are those stumbling blocks? And how do we use this data analysis of the customer to say, hey, if we know a three alarm fire generally starts in the kitchen in our scenario, right? Let, let's put monitors in the kitchen and let's just burn the stove down, not the kitchen or the house, right? And so you all have war stories about customers that went one way. So what was that and how do we detect it early? You can't detect everything, but there's a lot you can do. Um, the other question I get a lot is um, monetizing CSM services. So CSMs have kind of be become, so the second S in SaaS is, is service. So when you pay for whatever, you're, you pay a price, right? Now price is inclusive of what comes up in your web browser, the data that goes through some pipe into some analytics, the people on the other the phone, you know, it's not the nickel and diming generally of here's pro serving, here's support, and this is this, and this is that. However, however, I have found that especially in high touch uh, and high value, high ASP environments, you can kind of segregate baseline CSM activities from premium activities. And, and here's the simple way I kind of um, separate those things is for every single customer, and I don't care if you have 100,000 customers or you know 10 huge ones, you want to enable them to be successful, right? The right training at the right point, the, you know, the support, uh, product feedback. I mean, you're gonna do all this stuff to, to help them get trained, give some level of business reviews, which could be an automated email report of their usage activity, right? It doesn't have to be a, what everybody calls a QBR. Um, so all of these things though, enable the customers. And what I found is there are some customers who are budget constrained, domain knowledge constrained, or just really recognize your expertise in what you do. 
be it recruiting, medical imaging, performance reviews, what have you. And I have found a lot of those customers are willing to pay for what I call doing, right? So my last gig, we, I had a third of my customer base who bought something we just called CSM Diamond. It was amazing how you know, good salespeople can say, hey, we do all this stuff and I got tons of references, but you know, I heard you say in our, in our discussions, your budget constraint, blah, 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 we can do other stuff. So I kind of turn that more as the doing piece. An executive says, hey, Sharisha, I want you to be at my executive meeting every you know, Monday or provide me a report every Monday on the stuff. So that's more than just basic enabling and customers will pay for it. So one question I've gotten asked is, what do you charge? And I'm sure there are product marketing people who are way smarter and more sophisticated than I am, um, but I look at it very simply because when you talk to your board members and your CEO and your CFO, everything is going to be justified with numbers. Really simple. So what's your total FTE price of a really good CSM? Let's just call it 200 round, round numbers. That's probably a little high, but you know, if somebody paid you 200 grand for something, I guarantee you can go to your CFO or CEO and get a headcount. So divide it up. Is that doing bucket a quarter of your time? So now instead of Mark having this big portfolio, you know, of 15 or 20 to one or whatever your ratio is, um, you can now say, hey, I got these four diamond customers paying and slice it and dice it. The customers will pay for it. So we divide it in thirds. It was about 70 grand. And for big customers, rounding error, rounding error for the value we gave them. How does that differ from old support models? Then? Well, it really isn't. It's just putting a layer just, above like, that journey. And it's, it's actually just going beyond the enabling piece. So it is similar, right? But it's now a subscription-based sort of defined thing that doesn't end. As opposed to ProServe, I'm just paying you dollar for hour. And you come in yeah, the project in the U.S. Sure, but support's ongoing. Oh, so this isn't this customer is, support. This is the CSM's really doing more. Right, but so my point is, so I spent 12 plus years at NetSuite, scaled from 5 million to 500 million. We were before CS, CS existed mm -hmm. as a function. Yeah. Um, and we did this, but we called, it was just under, it was called platinum support. Yeah. And you had, you know, it was exactly the math, like one, one platinum person could support or yep. clients and um, they were a dedicated person that they could call and yep. they were in essence a customer success person but you know call something different looked yeah. as, a, as a support model so how do you differentiate cs from support very from simple support? cs is, is proactive helping them achieve business goals supports break fix and you can have premium levels in both yep. because in really complex products like uh White Hat Security, Sybase database, and you know database internals. Those are things where the support activity isn't um, a negative because I'm calling you. It's just a complex product, and I need your technical reactive help, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, I I sold a full body to MCI, the old telephone company, back in the '90s for 250k, and it was an on-site dedicated support person. Yeah. It was the same thing. Yeah. Break, fix, call, engineering, deploy, releases, whatever. But they were that big of a customer. But that's way different than the proactive dedication of saying I'm going to pay for platinum. And yeah. so that's why I kind of clarify terminology, right? Because like some people rate. call it support, some people call it success, what's pro serve. And at the end of the day, all of these things are just labels for activities we're doing. So it really boils down to you know, what are those activities intended to do, right? And these, both these enabling and doing activities sit on top of support. And they're all a piece of helping the customer to get to their desired outcome. You know, the thing is, is a lot of what people think about, and you, know, you have a bad quarter of bookings and the board's, or revenue and the board says why, and they say, well, churn was a little higher, and then everybody goes into, you know, house on fire mode, right? And so, um, you know, that's internally, that's what we're trying to do. Get retention up, get churn down, get the dollars up. But really, if you're focused on the customer's outcome and their journey, those things, you know, renewals and upsell are part of the journey. It's not a negative. It's not like a nail biter, I hope we get it. If you're helping the customer be successful, additional products and continuing the relationship is a great thing. It's not a negative, right?
the other term um, in this area is named account manager. Yeah. That's the other term that, that's often used. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other piece that um, Sharisha meant uh, is segmentation. And when you're small, you know, everybody's important and you embrace them all. But at some point in your journey, uh, you're going to have some level of segmentation, right? All customers aren't equal, regardless of what you do, big dollars, small dollars, etc. In my last um, venture, we had about 80 customers and um, we had customers that had two. One, we had one customer who had over $3 million in ARR. Um, you know, and on the low end was a hundred thousand in ARR, right? Which yeah. most of us would go, wow, hundred thousand ARR. That's really good. But that was on the low end for us. So having that segmentation, so, cause they might have similar journeys, but they might be different. You know, that white glove journey with that super strategic customer might have some twists and turns in it that the journey for the swipe your visa card and do the trial and just get on board. Um, so, there's no right or wrong in how you do that segmentation, but it is important to understand that your journey has different flavors and that that understanding it allows you to apply people, process, and technology to those segments intelligently. I want to add one thing for this is, um, you know, usually the segmentation is done on the MRR or geographic location. That's a common one. But the interesting segmentation tactics are success potential and influence. And the example is, let's assume that you have Cisco as a customer and Splunk as a customer. Splunk is, let's say, paying you uh, 50K, uh, right, per annum. And let's say Cisco is paying you 10K per annum. So if you segment on, on the basis of MRR, Splunk is an important customer. But if you think about success potential, then Cisco may be a, may be a more important customer because you have way more flexibility there to grow. Right. Yeah. But if you factor in, I like your influence part because yes. Cisco may not go public and talk about yeah. how they're using you because they exactly. have corporate legal who's going to kibosh that. Yes. But Splunk might be much more willing. Yes. So, um, actually had them as customers at next week. Splunk was a much better champion for us, I'll say, than Cisco. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Or CA for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. Another example of influence is let's say you're currently not in clean tech energy sector. And there's one customer you have who can be the beachhead, right? And so you then, you know, essentially focus on the success of that particular customer, uh, though it may not be justified from the MRR perspective, right? So those are the new segmentation criteria that I have seen in my experience being used in a, in a powerful way. Um. The other thing which seems really simple um, is just making sure your master customer record is clean. I've ever, it's like every company I've gone to has been a disaster at the start when it comes to Salesforce, depending on when you started and who did what. And if your sales ops person turned over, then they come in with new, I want to do it this way versus that way. It, in the end, it all doesn't matter. That record, wherever it sits, generally Salesforce in our high tech SaaS world, but maybe not always, right? Um, Zendesk, um, uh, what is it, InfoSoft, or I don't know. Uh, but that, it's, it's absolutely critical because if you need that, if you're going to have that 360 degree view of the customer, yeah, there's usage and there's support tickets and all that, but the logistics of you know, who bought, what they have, when they did it, how much the renewal is, what's their, um, you know, are they willing to give a testimonial versus, you know, they're, they're shut down on PR. I mean, there's all kinds of nuances you will have about who's who in the zoo at your customers, right? Because now you know who your customer is, what the logo is, where they are, you know, who did what to sell them, but now who are all the people underneath that? So it sounds like, you know, simple stuff, but it's amazing. It's amazing how many companies, um, you know, it, yeah, it's the, it's the master record, but, and if you don't get those butts cleaned up, then you start to kind of question the data. And because this becomes the hinge of this 360 degree view, it really does have to be, you know, as near perfect or keep up with your business as possible. Yeah. Two anecdotes that I'll share is uh, walked into one customer and uh, they provided uh, access to their SRDC, Salesforce, and we picked the data, 
and then the customer informed us that don't look at the MRR field. The actual field you should consider is true underscore MRR. Right. So, so, so basically, uh, the important thing is make sure that your data integrity is there. Right. That's one. Second is, um, you know, the uh, with one customer, I found it interesting that they actually had a field defined in uh, Salesforce that said uh, customer expectations, and they mandated that their sales team, right, as soon as they close a customer they actually document the expectations that, that the customer has so that the CS team knows when they're getting into, into a call, their initial kickoff call with the customer, what expectation is there with the customer. Yeah, and that's always a challenge, right? I mean, sales folks, yeah, Salesforce is more of a, I have to use it more than I want to use it, but it is the place to capture all that data. Because if you miss it, then, and you go to the customer in the onboarding sort of phase and you don't know all that stuff, you look kind of stupid. Like, why is it the guy who's holding me this, telling me this sort of stuff? Yeah. In fact, in fact, I, uh, you know, with one of the customers, um, customer success team that I was interacting with, they were uh, mentioning that the sales team, the salesperson walks up to them and said, you know, we sell dreams while you manage disappointments. <laughs> so, get that right. So, so, yeah. so um, your your very first opportunity to succeed or not is an onboarding, and we skipped through a slide where I had the velocity to value, um, but really I kind of have this perspective that, especially in this kind of high value B two B sort of stuff that most of us are in, not all. You know, some business person had a problem. You prove that your solution solves the problem. They write a big check, and in between them writing a big check and value flowing out the end of your solution, whatever that is, there's a window of time, and it could be as simple as an, an email where everything is turned on in you know minutes or hours, or I, you know it could be as long as you know weeks or months, right? But um, that is that is absolutely the beginning of, of the customer journey that has to be done right. I actually had a really detailed playbook for the handoff process. So it wasn't just go into Salesforce and make an onboarding call because our solutions were complex enough and the sales cycle was long enough that I start talking to you in September and you tell me all your business things. We talk about your business in September and October and November and then the holidays pass, and then we re-engage in January, and we agree to do a Q1 deal, and now it's March, and we do a Q1 deal, and we've been focusing on the contract, and the legal was a pain, and the finance was a pain, but we finally got the deal done, and now it's March, and all the stuff we were talking about was September, and I don't know a single business who was static from September to March, so you gotta recalibrate at some point, right? And so I had a detailed playbook for that handoff internally, and it became a big part of the um, customer onboarding and kickoff process. So for me, whether it was a call or in a high value situation, it was on site. Part of that playbook was literally the business sponsor getting everybody up to date with where the business challenges have morphed. We acquired this company. We had a new exec come in. Our competition acquired a company. Now it's forcing us to think different. So at that point, kickoff, it's key that you really understand and calibrate on, on those sorts of goals. So we made that part of the actual kickoff, setting expectations with the business sponsor, um, you know, and so forth. So that way you walk away with what their issues are and what they view as customer success and desired outcome, right? And from there, you can start to map out some of the pivot points you need to touch base with that, uh, with that business sponsor. So one kind of digging into that a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, what enterprise sale there's usually multiple stakeholders right so what do you do in the circumstance where like sales is dealing with the decision makers where they have one set of expectations you mm -hmm. capture that doing great tracking mm -hmm. it all the implementation team let's say is on the it side and they have different expectations mm -hmm. and you know basically like you're left helping them communicate with their own organizations because you are getting measured at yeah. which one do you focus on absolutely the business person because yeah. if the business person says 
here's my journey and it's March and you know, success means on June 1st, we do blah. And by July 25th, we've got this conference. Um, you know, things have to align to that. And so the issue, and I've, I've experienced this throughout my career is you could have everything set up perfectly, the CSM, the training, the schedule, the this and that. And then the developers go, we're busy, too busy. We've got other things on my plate, right? Um, this is just one of 50 things in my agile list and not pushing it to the next sprint. Yet doing that's going to cause you to miss your business objectives. So part of what I, you know, like to do, especially in kind of the high value sort of accounts is by having the CSM or the CSM exec have at least that relationship with the business person, you have the ability to go back to them because to me, it's a partnership. It's not a one-way street where, hey, I bought your stuff, now I'm just gonna sit back, make me successful. Eh, doesn't work that way, right? You have to do stuff, I have to do stuff. And yeah, it's complex, and yeah, we have a lot of people, and yes, our calendars are hard, but at the end of the day, we just put big money on the table to achieve this goal. Maybe you know, cut out all the fluff, that's what we're trying to do. And so I view kind of escalations as a two-way street. I have no problem calling the business sponsor and saying, look, we are currently on target to do X, Y, and Z for your June 1st target, but I need your help because within your organization, this is falling down. Yeah, I guess we have a slightly unique circumstance is that we have a two-headed beast with, mm -hmm. so physicians need to sign off and be involved and mm -hmm. I really are users. Mm -hmm. However, IT has the budget mm -hmm. and so we often have to reconcile priorities across the two teams yeah. um, because if we don't do well by IT, then we're not going to be able to grow it. They're not mm -hmm. going to sign off on, you know, having more of a land and expand strategy yep. at the account, et cetera. So think, we often mediate. Yeah, no, and I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's probably a more common thing than not. Yeah. You know, because I'm working with an e-commerce company that sells to retailers, and those are the big, you know, folks mm -hmm. who have the big sticks who can dictate how they want, but the real challenge, and I mentioned they're trying to go from 25 to five, or 2,500 to 5,000 customers, it, are all these other suppliers who have a different sort of agenda and set of priorities. So um, I don't have a canned answer to say, just do it this way and everything's perfect, but we'll acknowledge that is a very real challenge. And I think if you map that journey out, you can you know, literally, visual, I'm a very visual person, right? So I, I wanna chart things and draw pictures and pull it all together and then we can distill it into words. What is that journey? And you know, we got to talk to the physician, where are the friction points and what works well? And so it's not, it's not, here's the perfect answer, but if you dissect it with how it flows and where the friction points are, you can generally at least start to take uh, uh, cycles at making it better. Yeah. And it's, it is a challenge. And it's actually a, a big challenge for all the folks who are focusing on marketplaces, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because then they have to, uh, they have two segments, Correct. different yeah. segments. I was uh, the other day I was talking to somebody at Uber, right? So they have to focus on success and user. They also have to focus success for the drivers, right? And their actually priority is more drivers because if the drivers are successful and they stick with Uber, then the users have more options, right? So that's why they were. Uh, you know, focusing more on the drivers. All right, so just to wrap on onboarding, you know, critical piece and get, get the customers out the gate. That's your springboard for the customer's journey. Um, in mapping out that journey, uh, Sharisha um, talked about playbook, and, and really they're just repeatable recipes that the CSM team can use. Um, my preference in putting together playbooks was not to be to the task, because generally... You can't until I tell them. You can. Now they're on mute. Um, so, you know, playbooks are just simply kind of recipes and, and workflows that, you know, um, no different than a play, a quarterback's going to call in different sort of scenarios. And they not only benefit, well, they benefit you in a couple ways. One is, is everybody's doing things consistent. Hey, I got an escalation or I've got a QBR coming up. What do I do, right? So put some consistency to what you do. Um, it also helps with folks you've just hired. You know, I've never done this before. 
uh, what I do. So um, I generally make playbooks kind of um, prescriptive at a high level and give people the ability to, you know, do the right tasks underneath it. Um, I know there's some, um, some companies where you're dealing with such a, a perfect recipe, if you will, every time, right? You have to check these six boxes that the playbook does get kind of task oriented. Um, let me flip to the next slide. Um, but these are just examples of different playbooks you probably want to have documented. And ultimately, these playbooks get um, not just put somewhere electronically and accessible, but what you want to do is morph these uh, using a, an automation platform like Stripe Deck so that um, you know, when you're engaging with a customer, these aren't just documented, hey, when, you, when your stakeholder leaves, here's what you do, but they're actual um, there are actual things that track the workflow, where you're at in it, uh, and so forth. So um, some are kind of reactive. How do I handle an escalation? And a lot of them are proactive. You know, what do you do if you're in a meeting and you hear your stakeholders say, hey, we acquired this little company and they could probably use your solution too, right? Your intent should be, so what do you do? What's the plan? Because if, if there is no, here's what you do, then everybody's going to do something different. And then God forbid you miss the opportunity and that comes, you know, that comes back. So these are just kind of, I would say the table stakes of playbooks. And once again, um, I would suggest, you know, what are the most important things uh, out of this list to you start there. And from that, you're going to get way more sophisticated and you get to be a gorilla, like a success factors or a, uh, Salesforce and, you know, uh, we mentioned Zoom, you know, they're going to be way more sophisticated, but those are all falling into the you know, big company realm. And, you know, that's not exactly where we're at. The one thing that I want to share is that uh, in recent times, I found that the number one reason for churn has been stakeholder change. Mm -hmm. So the new uh, incoming stakeholder uh, has his or her favorite tools, right, that they want to bring on board. And so uh, definitely would recommend thinking through the stakeholder change playbook and, and how to uh, use that. I've got a lot of marketing friends and uh, uh, recently I was talking to a CMO uh, who has about 30 tools in the sales and marketing tech stack. So they are using 30 tools. And uh, <laughs> so the, the CMO was saying that every quarter uh, they remove five percent of the tools and bring in new tools. So, so there are, could be various reasons for churn. So, having a having a playbook for that makes sense. Well, if you notice, I have their churn customer. So, we'd all like to have hundred percent. Everything's perfect, and everybody's growing and happy. And that's not reality. So, what is the playbook when you get the churn? Because not not only how do you handle it, but what do you do? But then there's the back end within the company to do the analysis of where your churn is coming from. I mean, at the end of the day, that's going to point you back to what's what's going wrong fundamentally. To Sharisha's point, you have a perfect company doesn't need marketing, doesn't need customer success because you know the product's so wonderful and intuitive and just happens. Yeah, you know, we're not needed. Right? So. Um, the other one, I, I, I referred to QBR, but I like calling these executive business reviews because this idea of quarterly, um, it falls too much into the what we need as vendors. You know, it's the end of the quarter. That's we true. need money. We need a renewal. What's our number? <laughs> well, if you're a SaaS business and you're monthly renewal, then the quarter's way too late. Well, <laughs> you know, um, in, in high value, high tech situations, you're not going to do this, you know, and, and as, you know, as, as our uh, friend pointed out last night from the VC world, you know, this is a cost. This is an expensive playbook, right? But use it judiciously, right? And this is your chance to calibrate what happened at that kickoff with the business sponsor. And if they say, hey, that June 1st is our first pivot milestone, and that happens to be 2.6 months away, well, nail that EBR for 2.6 months away, so you're you're right there with them, you know, on their journey. Um, I have found where where you just kind of set off, and and the tactics go this way, if you will, with IT, and the business goes this way, and then you come to the renewal, and then you've got this huge gap between the two, you know, and shame on us as the vendors for for letting that happen. Um, you might try, and they resist, right? 
Um, but but I wouldn't um, I wouldn't just leave it to chance because you know at that point you could have diverged greatly from what their desired outcome is, and then at the end of the day that stacks up to to churn for us. Yeah. One interesting thought here that I recently heard is uh, if your customer feels that they have achieved whatever they could with your product, they chuck. So. Uh, because then they would want to try another product where they can achieve more, right? At least they are inquisitive about what the other product has to offer, right? So you have to constantly lead them to the next milestone. So I just, we have, there's a bunch of slides on metrics and I'm not going to go through each and every one. I know that the, um, the folder Sharisha has, you know, has all kinds of stuff. Um, but I think, you know, this comes back to a little bit of where um, customer success is a team sport and it starts with the CEO and then, you know, product and marketing and the actual function of CS, you know, come into play. Um, so, you know, metrics I, I found and, and frankly have made the mistake before of not in my early days calibrating on some of these things. You know, what is the CEO's view of churn and so forth and expectations? And if I'm going to invest in a customer success team, what's, what's the output and ROI on that? You know, CFOs are going to look at things radically different, right? Um, if a CFO has been in the SaaS world and understands there's a cost of retention, which there is, Right, um, you know, it's going to be a different discussion. Unfortunately, I've dealt with a lot of CFOs who, you know, were very new to the SaaS world, and all they thought about is customer acquisition costs, and that retaining your customers is just a cost center, and I want to invest as little as possible in that. I went to one company where they hired me to set up and launch a customer success program. They had 300 plus enterprise customers, most of them household names. These are all websites you guys go to and shop on every day. And um, company was about 200 people. And, you know, they had a couple missed quarters. And, you know, so the CFO was in his cocoon collecting all the money. And they gave me one headcount for 324 enterprise customers that, comp that added up to $25 million in ARR. And, you know... <laughs> Mistake I made is I sh that should have been my, you know, discussion in in the interview, because now I'm I'm gear you know I am guaranteed to fail because I cannot exercise my profession in a way that's at least within the bounds of something realistic. You can't create a sales team, have a fifty million dollar quota, and give somebody two headcount. Everybody understands that in sales. Nobody would shake their head at that. But you go into CS and you say, well, my my customer base looks like this, and I need this many people, and I've done my segmentation, and here's how we're going to overlap, and it's a fight. So uh, understanding the sources, the expectations, because in the end, in the end, the data has to be trusted, right? And I had a situation with one of the analytics company I was at where they had product flaws, bugs, that caused the data to be wrong in very you know, kind of odd times. It wasn't frequent, but it was enough that they doubted all the data, right? Because, you know, uh, if if it's wrong two times out of a hundred and I have to make a business decision and it's one of those two times, I'm host, right? So it has to be, you know, your master record we talked about, your usage data kind of doesn't lie, right? Um, uh, but, you know, how do you define churn? Like churn is, is it the number of customers or is it the ARR? In the end, dollars speak, right? Revenue is the best deodorant, you know, line from the SVP of sales at Commerce One. Um, you know, and, and people are going to challenge things and that's okay. Um, but I think getting that level set um, so that everybody agrees on what's going on, you can report on it regularly, um, and it puts everybody in the same boat is key because as a CS executive, if I have marketing and product and everybody else going, yeah, you know, these are the right things to be doing to you know, get these agreed upon KPIs going in the right direction. Um, that's a lot better than you know, have internally fighting because you know something has to be done. Uh, I think we talked about all that. Um,
Yeah, this is just kind of the drill down. I would say this is, you know, um, there's a lot of different departmental sort of goals. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is important is a health metric, but it can be super subjective to super uh, objective is, you know, health. How do you rate health? Right. Um, and so, you know, some of these metrics are really super quantifiable, bugs, tickets, response times, SLA, you know, but, but health is that one that um, if it's super, super, super high touch, it might be very subjective because you're talking to the customer every day. Or if it's all low touch based on usage and so forth, it could be really, really programmatic, right? So that's one that um, uh, defining what, determines health versus uh, what's the opposite of health, and I call it customers at risk, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is that? And having, one of the things I'd encourage you to do is for, um, if you're gonna rate customers at risk, have some way of a taxonomy to, um, yeah, you can go ahead to that one. Yeah, have a taxonomy to understand the reasons why. So that was one of the things I did, um, is when I did my executive reports and showed the pie chart of, you know, here's the whole pie, which is 100% of our customer base, and there were three shades of green, and then there was yellow, orange, and red. And anytime you show, you know, a metric like that, you know, any senior executive is gonna say, why? And, and you know, you're gonna need to double click. And so I was able to double click into the red, and then I had very specific buckets of, um, of where things, um, where things fell. Um, but all these organizations are going to be interested in, in a variety, uh, you know, a variety of metrics, some that CS can, CSMs can directly influence some of them. Uh, we talked about usage a little bit. I don't know if, what you want to add on um, onto this, Risha. You know, usage yeah. um, can be proactive or, or, sort, of, or, or sort of reactive. Right, um, but instrumenting your product and having that view into utilization is key. And this comes back to product, right? And so products that haven't thought about getting this data out leaves you without that 360 degree view. Yeah, I have seen uh, in my experience that a uh, lot of companies, and it's surprising how large that number is, they're not capturing the utilization metrics. And it's an afterthought, right? And uh, what happens in those cases is that uh, engineering doesn't have time to instrument the product and the customer success team then have to chase down the engineering team, asking them, requesting them multiple times to get the utilization metrics, right? Because without that, you're, you're basically, uh, you do not have enough insight into how the customers are using, leveraging the product, right? So you could potentially get utilization metrics from basic analytics tools itself. You know, even as basic as Google Analytics could provide you some insight, uh, Mixpanel uh, and other analytics products could provide uh, usage metrics, and then customer success platform, you know, like Strike Tech can, can take that to the next level where you're tracking in the event. And what, one of the things just on Google Analytics, and many of you probably know more about this than I do, but I was told that, for, for Google Analytics, you can't get things down to a user level. It, it, um, it violates their legal terms and conditions. Um, on the site or in the, in the product? Like no, in the site. So yeah. Google Analytics yeah. is a way to say, hey, is Mini logging in a lot? Because Sharish is not, I want to know if something's going on at the company. Well, so login is the key there. Like Google does well if it's just like anonymous tracking. Yeah. But once you that's it. log in, then you need to build your own metrics into the product. Exactly. So that, exactly. That's, and that's, that's unknown user versus the known. Yeah. And and really to understand what's going on, you gotta be knowing. I mean, if you want to get macro macro metrics on you know pilots and conversions and stuff like that, it's probably different. So, I mean, to, to speak to that, um, the intercom is extremely useful in terms of implementation. Like, right off the bat, without you really having a lot of uh, dev time associated with it, it just gives you like a widget and then also tracks sessions, what companies are a part of, you know, just registers everything. Yeah, I've used intercom and I loved it for all the reasons you just cited. It, it's, it's crazy how little dev time. Too. I mean, they really sure. did a great job. 
Well, you know, that so that, the other thing I've had instrumented is I want in product NPS. That's also a really quick little yeah. widget, yeah. right? And there's other things that Strike Deck does that helps to instrument your product. And I think um, five years ago when I ever went to a dev team with these requests, I got, you know, talk to the hands, not yeah. doing it, we're busy. <laughs> and I think recently, I think dev teams are like, yeah, we want to know that too. So I think there's a willingness, the challenge or the, the thing I'd encourage you to is although Intercom does all this stuff, which is awesome, and I know there's Pendo and there's all kinds of other really cool technologies, um, getting it into that 360 degree view now makes it a piece of the workflow. It makes it actionable. And I know we're not gonna drill down on Strike Deck product, but most of the you know best, the best of the, the um, CS platforms have that ability to take triggers and actions which is what you're saying, you know, is Mini accessing this new feature, is Candace logging in, you know, all that sort of stuff. And you can automate the response to some of that, you know, hey, Mark, you notice you haven't logged in and so forth. So although Intercom does it, which is great, the question and the challenge is, is you know, for the CSMs who have to plan their day and activities and what to do and the, all these early warning systems, it's making sure that's part of your, your holistic view and it's not just a silo of data, right? Um, there's a couple, I'll just give you my opinion on things I've seen that have worked and not worked. Um, and it's just my experience. It's not right or wrong. So I'm, I'm just sharing war stories and hopefully saving you guys scars that, um, I've already taken. Um, but regardless of where CS sits in the organization, the, this, the biggest key is how you're working with the other teams, regardless of the hardwired work structure. And it's having really good communication and relationships. These four organizations are the, are the do or die for customer success. Um, you know, having that hook into a product, um, the feedback, the voice of the customer, a way to um, give priorities from the field. Um, you know, we used to aggregate the feature requests from the customers and then do a uh, a CSM kind of sorting and ranking because you know you're not going to have 20 CSMs calling products because of course they're customers the most important yeah so as a team you got to figure out how to you know triage and prioritize what you want for your customer base uh, as well as how do you communicate out new product features so you know that gets into the marketing cadence and, and the ongoing communication uh, generally most SaaS companies have a landish and expandish sort of strategy, not everybody, but most. And so um, unlike the product world where you sold and then it was this post sales activity, in my experience with these B2B companies, the sales, the beginning of the selling, right? So I always say this to sales, I'm not saying your job's easy. I couldn't do it. I know getting a new customer is brutally hard, right? And it takes just as long to get a $50,000 deal than it does a $200,000 deal. So I acknowledge that. However, in the SaaS land and expand, let me continue to add value to you world. Um, that's the beginning of the selling. And so um, the way I looked at it is the selling team was generally the salesperson and the SE and whatever other resources you need. And really what happens when it becomes a customer is that team expands and kind of the leader driver sort of changes now to the post-sale CSM world, but the salesperson doesn't, go devoid of it, right? Um, now, organizationally, depending on who owns renewals, who owns the transaction, that can all change, but that, that is vitally, you know, vitally important. We talked about finance and, you know, at the end of the day, finance is about getting the resources you need and the support you need to resource and fund, you know, the appropriate uh, outcome of the CS team. One trap not to fall into is to make your CSM's core bearing, right? So yeah, and I'll talk about that in a second. I, I believe to be a trusted advisor, you have to separate, and I have had very few people disagree with this, and I'm not saying it's right, it's just a perspective, um, but I found in my travels far and wide, it's, it's generally agreed upon that, you know, to, I've, had, I've had customers say, we need a meeting, we need to talk about this, we need to recalibrate, blah, 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 don't bring the salesperson. Yeah. And it's not that they don't like you. It's just that they know that, you know, September 30th, you're going to be uptight. December 31st, you're going to be up. They don't want it, right? And so 
I make that real clear as part of the kickoff, that part of the CSM's responsibility is your success uh, and they are not quota driven. Now, that's different than their compensation and how we give them their bonus, just like everybody else in the company. We all get our variable comp based on some metric of success, but that's different than quota. And I think that's really critical and we're gonna talk about that in a second. Yeah, I want to point out one other thing here is that uh, I'm interestingly seeing Customer success also involved in pre-sales in companies that offer free trial, right? So they are not yet customers, but they are still engaging with the product. So I've seen customer success being also passed with that function. Um, in other cases, uh, I've seen customer success getting involved is where you have a free product. Like in your case, you mentioned there are 800 users you have who have not yet become customer right but are using a product then are you guys responsible for their experience as well yeah yeah i mean to a certain <laughs> extent but what we've done is have more proactive you know kind of like you're talking about the different levels of customer success where you got to talk to your time mm -hmm. basic um for that it's more writing in an email to support first us actively supporting the product through like the widget of intercom for example where it's just like it's extremely direct and more instantaneous. Wait. Any questions? So um, I've had one one scenario where I reported directly into the CEO, and two scenarios where I reported into CRO. Uh, I think best practice, in my opinion, in a startup, you know, sub 40 million, ideally the customer success executive or leader is reporting directly into the CEO. Um, because like I said, I mean, you, you can go look at all the case studies of these companies that have just blown it out of the water. And it's that CEO who also has the influence over the CFO, the product people, the engineering, the delivery schedule and the numbers. Um, has that direct sort of tie to it. I would say the other functional executive, which sometimes is the same as a CRO or the COO, which you know might, might have that responsibility as well. Um, and, and that's worked well for me when the CRO uh, had a, a good mentality for customer success and post sales. Uh, but as I say, it, it, when I go back and kind of look at things that have worked well in, in the startup world versus not, uh, the CS leader has a seat at the table. You know, if the voice of the customer is saying X, it's not buried down in a uh, delivery professional services uh, sort of capacity. And that's just, you know, from my, from my experience, not right or wrong, but generally these are the scenarios you see in, in the smaller organizations. Um, and really, you know, through the life cycle, obviously customer success at the heart of deployment and adoption, but we already went back to this, you know, and I did a, um, I actually did a whole presentation at a meetup for Sharisha last summer about how to engage with sales. Cause really, you know, everybody's behind you, sales, whoever, uh, product, you know, the whole company's in customer success. I can't say that enough, uh, but customer success and the account executive really need to, need to link uh, as a team because Back to your point, many about quota and, and uh, all that stuff. Um, I believe they should own the transaction, right? Because um, I've never had most, most of the profiles of customer success people I've had is about 50-50 about kind of domain. You know, I get this world and good account management skills. They're, they're curious, they're analytical, they're smart. Um, you know, I can teach you Java, but I can't teach you to be a positive person. You know, I could teach you to follow a playbook. I can't teach you to be empathetic. Um, I could teach you how to use strike deck. I can't teach you how to be curious. Right. Um, so there's just some innate things that, um, and I think salespeople, one of the things they kind of have is that negotiation, uh, contract, they do that. Right. And so, um, to me, putting a CSM into that role really changes the profile of the person. 
and starts to diverge from the pureness of what, what it could be. So we'll talk in a minute about some comp stuff. Just going back to your real point, where to engage in the cycle, um, we actually have found bringing like the CS discussion into the end of the sales cycle. Like if you're, totally. if someone's stuck on totally. closing with you, mm -hmm. it's a great way totally. to add value and show what their experience is going to be. So we actually use it as a closing tool. And, and so, so I'm glad you brought that up. That is an excellent point. When we did our sales kickoff last year, um, my boss, Brian Carr, who was a CRO, he got up and he said, what better assumptive close than to bring in your CS head and do a... While we're waiting worse, for legal. Yeah, while we're waiting for legal. Let's show you what exactly. your kickoff call is going to be like. And, and let's, here's, how, how, here's how we're going to make you succeed and get them going, wow, you know? I, I feel a comfort level for what I can do. It's great, great input. Uh, why don't you skip on, skip on this one? Um, in my experience, customer support has always been part of customer success. Um, but the other things, you know, depending on the company, I think training is an outdated sort of concept, personally. The idea I'm going to train you is, we're going to spend four hours, I'm going to stand in the classroom, or I'm going to give you a four-hour thing to watch. That is so outdated, it's ridiculous. I think um, we're into knowledge transfer, and we're into knowledge transfer at the pieces when you need to know it. In fact, I've been interacting with a couple of companies that do things along those lines, like micro-learning. Or we had a discussion earlier about community and knowledge base and when to deliver the right message at the right time. And so part of that is marketing and all the marketing messages and the new features and showing the customers all the value that's brought. Some of it is how do you do this? How do you do that? Some of it can be, you know, uh, how to's and, and, and problem avoidance for support. Um, but I have found training in my mind is really morphed as part of the customer journey that everybody needs to worry about. Right. And, a and, a um, part of why training was such a big deal in the enterprise software world. The damn stuff was so hard to install. It was hard to implement. It was hard to integrate. It was hard to use. It was hard to understand. And you know, people would spend a million dollars with Oracle and then $3 million with an SI to make it work. Well, of course you need training. So I think, and we should probably, you know, at least add into the slide, Teresa, is that I think I've seen that as, um, if we were going to make the boxes relative, that would be a really small, small box at this point, because it's really, it, you know, it's, it's incumbent on marketing and the CSM team and the product team to understand the customer journey and what they, what they need when. Um, you know, professional services um, is just that. To me, it's not, it can be part of customer success as an organization, often is, but I, um, my opinion and my experience has been that is its own bucket because you are measured on utilization and all that sort of stuff. And when you're done with the project, there's no long-term relationship. You pay for something, some results, some body, and, and you move on. Um, but advocacy, you know, obviously is, is, is probably duly shared between marketing, uh, marketing and, and customer success. They're tied at the hip on that one. You want to address this? So, well, one quick story sure. as we talk about people. Um, you know, when the CEO has that mentality of customers are so important, it manifests in their behaviors. Um, I, we went to a meetup um, about a month ago and, and a gal, Sylvie, presented how, um, how her CS team works with product. And in the course of her discussion, she said, I have 23 CSMs, blah, 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 blah. And so afterwards, I went up and I said, Sylvie, that was an awesome presentation. She had really some great practical um, you know, uh, suggestions about how to work better with product. And I'm thinking, 23 people. I mean, I was in a 200-person company, and I had 15 or 16 CSMs. And I thought, yeah, it was okay. We had coverage. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good. So I, I went up to her and, and congratulated her on her talk. And I said, Sylvie, how many people in your company total? Now, 300, right? She has 87. 23, 87 people, okay, had, uh, you know, were customer success people. And, and 
that the company funded two engineers who sat in essentially engineering, but their sole direction of what to do next, their sole direction of what to do next was from the CS leader and team, right? So it was really 23 plus two of 87. Well, that's a statement about sort of the importance. So um, I haven't seen in my experience any, you know, based on your size, it really is cutting your coverage model. Right. But to, to underscore Sharisha's point is uh, customer success, regardless if you have people with titles or whatever, it starts the second you, you have, you know, your first customer. So this idea of segmentation and their journey and what it's going to take is something that needs to be thought of early. Uh, because I think a lot of what um, a lot of what uh, business models are starting to see is that um, you know if you invest in your customers, it's not it's not this little um, we'll maintain our fifteen percent software maintenance fee. At some point, if you just graph out your revenue and you have one year plus customer revenue, and then you put on this year's new logo revenue, uh, at some point your existing customers are going to be more than you need logos and you can have a bad quarter, you know, and not get those couple new logos and miss your booking target. Um, but those existing customer revenues don't care about your bad quarter. Right. And so that's why the coverage uh, coverage is so key. So I think I believe you're going to actually start to see bigger CSM teams and, you know, maybe not bigger than sales per se, but it's going to be thought of as customer acquisition and customer retention and together, it builds the financial model of you know, how you how you allocate people. Right. So <clears throat> this slide and this slide, you know, it shows uh, these are the common um, uh, notions that exist. This has been uh, propagated by uh, Jason Denkins from Saster, right? And I've been asked, you know, how many CSMs should be hired for how many customers? What's the ratio mapping? There's no standard formula out there. I don't think you can have, right? It depends on who's leading the organization, what's a perspective, mindset, and all, right? Just like, uh, you know, every CEO of, of uh, a company is different. There are CEOs who are more um, from the product world, right? And there are CEOs who are more from the sales world. So the, the uh, one who's from the sales world, he needs, uh, you know, folks to augment, uh, you know, um, uh, who are on the product side and the person who's on the sales side needs uh, more uh, product guys to augment. So, so there's no, no magic formula out there, but you need to think how complex is the product. You know, the product needs handholding. If that's the case, then you need CSN to support. Product needs handholding. There should be a plan to, <laughs> to eliminate. I had, I, I kid you not, I had an interview with a guy, a security company here in the city, months ago, and he had about thirty people in his CSM group, and it was mostly reactive. When I got into the details, eleven and thirty were analysts. When I dug into what does an analyst do, it was tech support. It was the reactive bugs yeah. and stuff. But then I said, well, you know, what did the other twenty do? And only two of them talked to customers, which told me the rest of them were plugging holes in the dike. And he said to me, and this my you know, my my red flag just went straight up and turned neon bright flaming red, is he said most of the CSMs um, are out there making up for product deficiencies. And uh, you know, I wrote a blog four years ago that's still getting tweeted around today called, you know, customer success is not customer support. I wrote that coming out of White Hat because, you know, I, I, I wasn't new to support. I've been doing that since I was 24 years old, but I was new to the concept of customer success. And when I hired into White Hat, what they had was normal tech support. And it was a big group. And then they had premium tech support where it was a group of 10 people and each person had a list of accounts. And those accounts paid 50K a year, right? And, and so it was just premium support rebundled. Uh, compensation models, you know, this is all over the map as well. I'll just share my experience and what's worked and what I would uh, promote, you know, circumstances willing. Um, first of all, I believe CSMs are the type of position that have a variable to it, right? 
And uh, most, if not all, of the CS leaders I work with and network with, you know, agree and execute to that model. The question is, you know, is it um, is it kind of the corporate bonus or is it really tied to revenue? Um, I think that the more CSMs are really truly tied to revenue, the better chance you have at resource allocation. Um, and um, you know. I don't believe in quota, as we've talked about, because that changes your behavior, right? If paying your mortgage and feeding your kids is, you know, contingent on that, you're, it's good. Somebody has to do it, but it's going to change your behavior. So I've seen bonus plans, which um, to me are really devoid of people's actions, because in my experience, uh, you know, it's if the company doesn't make their booking target and it's not at 80% of what it was, nobody gets anything. Uh, now, the salespeople in that situation still get the commission for what they did or didn't sell, right? No matter what the booking of the quarter was. Mm -hmm. So the CSMs are out there trying to, you know, their journey still continues if you had a bad quarter. It doesn't, it doesn't change what you're doing. So to me, that's a really disconnected incentive. And frankly, unless you're just knocking it out of the park, and yay if you are, but if you look at the statistics of how startups really happen, um, that could become a very demoralizing way in incentive plan so it's not preferable um, the way i've uh, executed to it in a couple companies is actually putting the csms on a comp plan as opposed to a bonus plan meaning it's an 80 20 80 percent of your ote is your salary okay simple the other 20 percent is a variable that has to do with revenue components and um, to get away from the, it's my account and I only get paid on my account. Um, I paid my CSMs regionally because being a CSM is a team sport. Nobody knows everything. We rely on each other. And most of the CSMs at my last uh, uh, place, Conviva, which was super high touch. I mean, you might only have a portfolio of six customers, but it equals three or four million in ARR. And those, my team work hand and glove together. So what we did is we had a commission structure. It was literally commission. I worked with the CFO and the CFO would say, here's our 100%, we called it at par renewal target. It's called $100. And he agreed that, you know, perfection is not realistic and, you know, not everybody does that. So we set the renewal target at 85. So hitting 85% that par was considered at goal. So the CSMs got paid a percentage, you know, so $20 was my variable bonus. It was a calculation that was linear of what the renewal was. Very simple, just like a salesperson. Um, and then, so within the variable, it was divided 75% renewal, 25% new ARR. For salespeople, we flipped it. 75% of their commission was all on new ARR and 25% was on renewal. So they were incented to do the transaction and they were incented to keep the customer because if you want to land and expand, there's no, there's, I haven't seen a plan called lose and expand that's worked. <laughs> so they have to get the renewals table stakes. They have to do it even if they aren't getting paid. But uh, so they did uh, 25 new ARR and it was the same, you know, it's the same sales. So if we hit goal and we hit it out of the park, it was even accelerators. Okay, wait, so it's calculated regionally, and you said 85% of that as goal, and then how does it then flow down to? So that was the macro goal. Yeah. That was the, that was the goal line that you got to benchmark against, right? Yeah. So those were the macro numbers the CFO said. So, um, you know. But then on the per deal basis, I, I'm, how do you translate that out to the region? That's what yeah, so basically the numbers we'd measure you against were, okay, how do we do in North America? 85% was our goal. Did we get to 83% or did we get to 92%, uh -huh. right? And then the, comp and the uh, commission plan was accordingly. So if you were at 83%, you didn't get to 100% of that number. So you got a, a prorated version, yep. right? So yep. if it was 83%, it was close, but not quite there. But if you got only to 37%, you still got, you know, to that point. If you got over 85, you were considered exceeding quota. And then like most plans, it was kind of a three-tiered upside to it. So let's say we as a team, I'm the CSM, 
you're the salesperson. We've been working this big account, and yeah, they've upgraded a little and they've renewed a little. But you know, after two years, we do this mega, mega, mega expansion and just blow it out into other departments. You know, that's a huge win that not only the salesperson's going to benefit from, but the CSM has a vested interest in that that huge sort of we worked on this a long, long time sort of upsell. And and that, in my opinion, tied their mentality and tied their actions to those internal outcomes, right? Because those are internal outcomes hitting our numbers, right? The customers don't know what our targets are and our revenue is. Um, but you also, as a CSM, you translate that into, you know, Susie or Freddie's not going to renew if we don't make them successful, right? And so you back that into what your activities are for the outcome of hitting their business outcome, right? Which translates into um, being successful and hopefully a renewal. Now, as Sharisha pointed out, there could be sponsor changes, there could be natural disasters. If, you know, an acquisition happened. Um, uh, Verizon came and bought Yahoo. I said, immediately, Yahoo said, we don't care what you have to say. You know, we're getting taken over by Verizon, they'll talk to me. Not, it, they were totally successful. I don't know if you guys remember Yahoo did the streaming of a, a November uh, football game, which is the first uh, 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 video streaming just kind of out to the public and it was on the Yahoo website. Totally successful. We helped them through all that. Verizon bought them. That success meant nothing. Right? I mean, it's out of your control. You can't do it. And sorry, you said season uh, goal, 75% of renewal, 25% off sale. Yeah, so if I look at your, whatever your bonus is, that's mm -hmm. how I divide it up. And then in each bucket, you had its own calculation. One focused on the renewal target, one focused on a, uh, an ARR target. And that's something, you know, that's kind of derivative of the overall goals of the company, right? Right, because you're going to set out a quotas and targets and goals for the salespeople. And, uh, it's that new ARR target that's that other part of the bucket. And, you know, part of the profile of a CSM is they, they kind of, they, they have to be sales savvy. They don't have to be sales people. The funniest thing I have is uh, CSMs always, when you say something like upsell or cross sell, I'm not sales. I'm not good at that. I can't do that. And it's like I'm not asking you to do that. Um, quick story of, you know, how a CSM could be totally consultative totally consultative, yet play that role. When I hired on, um, the very first thing I did was get out in the field because my whole team was remote and the customer base was mainly in LA, New York, and in Europe where the media hubs are. So I went out to Spain to Telefonica with, my, with one of my European CSMs. And I was new to the company, so I was learning what the customers had to say, making relationships, and seeing what we do when we do these business reviews and kind of calibrating what I inherited. And so my guy, Jose, was talking to the business sponsor who said, yeah, you know, we want to do this. Uh, you know, we need to have insight into the set of pieces of business. And we're really scratching our head on this one. And Jose said, yeah, yeah we have, um, you know, part of what can be the platform can deliver these Atlas reports and they do this high end, this, that, this, and that. And the guy goes, yeah, that'd be really great to look at. And the conversation just went on and on. And then it had to do with integrating other data sources. And he kind of said, yeah, here's how we'd accomplish that. We'd use this thing we have and you do this and we do this. We can accomplish that goal. And the guy's like, awesome. That's exactly what I want to do. So we wrapped up the meeting and we had an hour to, to waste before getting back to the airport in Madrid. And so we went and had a, a, a coffee at a cafe. And so I was asking questions. I was writing my questions in my book to get clarification. on. I didn't want to interrupt the meeting as the newbie. And uh, I asked, you know, so tell me more about, you know, that thing you said, you went off on those Atlas reports. I think it's Mark, that's total upsell. They don't have any of that crap I was talking about. <laughs> but all Jose did is say, oh, that's what you're trying to do. You know, you, you're trying to climb that mountain and it's icy and you're going to need spikes on your shoes. And yeah we, yeah, we do all that stuff. He didn't even address, you don't have it, how much it costs. This is a future. None of that. It was completely consultative. So while we're sitting there having a coffee at the cafe, called the sales guy and said, hey, there's about three things here we just got logged to us that we need to get on the radar screen. Done. Wrong sales, wrong customer success. So this idea of I can't be a salesman, I'm not asking you to be a salesperson. 
just asking you to focus on the customer's outcomes and understand your company's goods and services. And there's a consultative way of doing that stuff. And uh, in fact, I just talked to one of my CSMs who's still there and the biggest successes right now are happening. He was, he's really good at teasing out this stuff and his accounts are just exploding revenue wise in a good way. Right. Cause he's just he's been planting these seeds. And then as the business gets further, the seed starts growing and the sales people are coming in and it becomes a team. It's a team sport. And, and the compensation is one way you can really drive how that clicks together. Now that worked for me. It could very well not work at all in, um, you know, in other environments or other environments where it's like, it's, it's low touch. And if you don't call 75 customers every two days, I know you can't be successful, so that's an MBO. And I think Cherisha uh, uh, had listed out a slide with a lot of MBO related stuff. So you're not factoring any usage into the comp model? Not in my scenario where it's solely revenue driven, but if you go, there could be scenarios. Yeah, because this assumes that you have a product to upsell. Like correct. if you've priced it in a way that you kind of go all in on, uh, but where you need to make sure the usage is there is to increase your stickiness factor and prevent the churn. And well, but go back to where, you know, if you use it a lot and you're successful, what are you going to do over real time? Or or renew. Renew. So if you're not using it yeah, okay. and it's collecting dust, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Uh, I was a white hat security renewal gal comes running down the hall, hair on fire. Oh, Fred's all pissed off and then put his invoice and blah, blah, blah. And we had no usage metrics without getting an engineer to unlock the covers and dig 42 feet deep. <clears throat> so I asked him to go dig 42 feet deep and he comes back and he's like, yeah, Fred hasn't logged in since uh, nine months ago. And I just turned around and I said, it's DOA. I mean, you can scream, yell, do flips. I understand we want the deal and you're upset, but um, it's not happening because the usage wasn't there. Now, mm -hmm. if I had a 360 degree view of the customer and I saw that our business sponsor, Fred, hasn't logged in in three weeks and his pattern was every Monday he logged in to check blah, blah, blah. That should be that proactive trigger that happens electronically that surfaces through a strike deck. And at least we would have had a chance to talk with Fred. Now, it could be Fred left the company, in which case now you've got a different playbook, right? The playbook is not, I don't like your product, so I'm not logging in. The playbook is Fred left and there's a new business sponsor. Or um, Fred's not seeing value, and so he's just throwing his hands up and you know considering a wash. And I've done that with products. I mean, a lot of what I talk about is not just as a guy who's ran customer success. I can tell you endless stories as a customer of why I wasn't taken care of and I switched from AT&T to Verizon, DirecTV to, you know, and they're consumer stories, but they're all the same. I'm paying you money. You're not getting me to my desired outcome. You're not taking care of me. Um, I've called you 20 times and screamed. Nobody seems to care. I'm out of here. So after literally spending $50,000 over 12 years with AT&T, I'm a very happy Verizon customer. You know, so sorry. So that, that analytical view, real time, you know, back to the automation that Sharisha was talking about, um, that in my mind, that's almost the underpinnings of the, the holy grail of how to be on top of this. It's not perfection, but if you don't have that insight, you're flying blind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you know, when you're looking at something that touches multiple user populations, mm -hmm. is kind of where more I was looking at the usage because you might have one group who like loves you and couldn't live without you, but you get a stakeholder change in some yep. other user population that you weren't even focused on. They force a change on yep. your happy group over here. If you're not looking at that across the whole world. Totally. And it gets complicated, right? It gets, separate. yeah. And it gets really complicated with big companies because you know, when you talk about pick your favorite big company, you talk about Verizon. Well, Verizon isn't just like this little company. It's like, you know, a company with 20 million tentacles that come off it. You know, another way to look at it is dividing up a monetary metric, renewals, upsell, whatever. So, so your intent is, is tied to the business outcome. And the other half you put in two MBOs, which are largely behaviors that they're incenting you to focus on that are in your control.
right? So there's no, you know, that would be perfectly viable, but uh, I'm sure there are situations that are completely devoid of the revenue numbers. I haven't seen them personally. No, they're always a component. Yeah. I was just curious yeah. of your take on it. Yeah. Like I said, it's not, I don't, I'm not, I'm presenting, sharing reality and stories because okay. I've just been in the muck so long. Um, it's not a, this is the tried and true way it only works in every company. Um, but I have seen enough of them that, mm -hmm. um, yeah. that uh, I've got enough scars that I need my long sleeves. <laughs> um, so a little bit about kind of customer feedback. Um, a lot of discussion I've heard lately just in, in the networking and the events Jeremy and I are doing about uh, NPS scores. We actually had a deep discussion yesterday with uh, with Matt and Dana on this, which are customers of Sharisha's. Um, do you guys use Net Promoter? Does anybody on the phone use Net Promoter currently? Not really. I haven't asked yeah. this. Um, so I, I've implemented in-app uh, NPS, which I strongly suggest. It doesn't cover the entire audience you guys address because there are people who are users of your solution that don't necessarily log in. So they never get surveyed. So there's different strategies to do that. Um, but um, I would encourage you to at least start collecting the NPS data soon because people are used to seeing it. It's a very simple question. I, know, I, I'm not a proponent of that the electronic capture of it. I'll why is that? Why. If you read the book, going back to the biggest thing they said was human interaction is what drives someone's sentiment on NPS. And so if you're measuring it like, and, and this may not be scalable for every business, but I think a conversation to cap to yes, collect NPS, don't automate it. I, I get a ton of those, they find them highly annoying. Because in in like one sentence, I'm not gonna be able to tell you what I'm frustrated about, why I gave the score I did. Well, story. actually, so here's my opinion of a best practice uh -huh. and how it works. So um I agree with you about the interaction, and that's actually really, really key. The reality is, is it's a multitude of interactions with a multitude of people, including your product, that forms that opinion. And I think that the actual answer, it's such a quick thing um, that here's how I captured it. Once again, not right or wrong, but it actually was really useful mm -hmm. is as uh, I had a vendor that I did an in-app capability, which I think you guys have, which is a little Java script snippet, really super easy. And then we set up rules. So don't survey Sharisha until 30 days after he's logged in for the first time, because oh, sure. he's not going to have an opinion, right? Yeah. And then you, uh, MPS isn't something you ask somebody every Friday. It's kind of, you know, you might ask them twice or three times a year. Tops, right? And so I said, after he responds, um, it's a four month window before the next one goes out. And he might not even respond to the next one. He might wait another month, but I know for a fact, it'll be a four month window. And the question is simply, would you recommend my company to your friends and colleagues, right? And the friends being, Am I gonna, you know, am I gonna talk to you about Zoom at a cocktail party? And weirdly enough, conversations come up, you know. Um, and it's a loyalty score, and it's somewhat like a ship liner. You know, you can do, oh my God, the product needs this, and we'll put it in. And it's not like NPS next week is gonna go like that. It's a very slow moving thing, but it is indicative of, of loyalty and tied to revenue growth. So I'm a big promoter of at least start collecting the data because you want to get to a point where it's statistically meaningful. Um, you know, I had one consulting client of mine, you know, let's get that implemented next week and then we can take it to the executives for their update the week after. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> the update is, is we're collecting the data. I didn't share an ounce of data for six months. Now, here's where it does get useful at a tactical level is that NPS typically will have, and I encourage this, you know, would you recommend us to friends and colleagues one through 10? And then a box that says, why'd you rate us that? Zero to 10. Zero to 10, you're right. Thank you for correcting me, zero to 10. Um, and then a comment. And ideally you're collecting the score of the comment and who said it. Um, the other thing is, is however you collect this and manage this and visualize this, um, look for the ability to tag the comments. Because I'm gonna say stuff like, you're awesome, 
And then other people are going to say, your UI sucks. And then other people are going to say, well, it was really hard to, you know, make a business decision based on this. And other people are going to say, your tech support rocks. And so some of those are like, really, okay, tech support is good. That's really simple. But you guys are awesome. Okay, that's cool. I'm glad I got a nine or 10, but what does that really mean? And other things are going to be like, you know, my team just loves using it because of the dashboard. So what I did is I kind of came up with about 10 sort of buckets and categories. I mean, don't overanalyze this stuff. Is support good? Yes or no. Is the UI good? Yes or no. In the big data analytical world, what I found was there was a difference between collecting this massive amount of data and turning it into valuable information. And that's where we fell down big, big time. But you had to weed through the comments to get to that, right? And that becomes really valuable. Quick story, CRO goes out to this huge, huge, huge broadcaster in London, thinking he's gonna do not only a two plus million dollar renewal, but he thinks he's gonna get a million dollar upsell. So he comes in, you know, ready to, uh, ready to knock it dead. And one of the, one of the business decision folks, uh, very influential, who was also a product user, had put in NPS data, and he gave us a zero, and it was very clear he was not happy. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, the data, we weren't at that, at that time, we were collecting it, but really not mining it. And so I, and it wasn't integrated into a platform like Strike Deck. Um, and so we missed that. Well, Boy, oh boy, going into that meeting, it should have been, in, well, actually two months before that meeting should have been an entirely, now we knew he was not the happiest guy in the world, but that was, you know, our, our head of, of, of sales out there immediately was like, Robert, you know, I just met with you last week and we're working through some issues. And I mean, I know we've got some challenges, but to rate us a zero is a disconnect from the lunch we had last week. And I'm cool with it being a zero, but I want to understand. And so that's where it did become actionable. And boy, you want to know that, you know, pretty quick, right? Different from, there's a lot of other stuff. So as, as, as we point out here, it's just a starting point. Um, but collecting that data early and being able to tag and analyze it becomes really useful. Because then it became, you know, support, support. If it's crappy, it's going to show up there, right? And it's a culmination of your interactions. Like if I have 50 interactions with you and 48 of them are just like stellar, I'm still, you know, those two aren't going to necessarily sway me, but if every single time I deal with your company, it's painful. So once again, it's the desired outcome through the interactions with your customers. Well, but in that scenario, if the crappy interaction was right before you get could be. that pop-up, I be. guarantee you, your score is going to reflect that. Could, and that's human nature. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's why NPS, I don't necessarily, unless it's a really specific, I talk to Fred and he's an idiot, or, you know, this product is crashing every day. If, you know, I'm careful about how I would reach out. Transactional surveys, you know, are easy to say, how do we do? We just closed your case. Did we respond well enough or whatever that? And is it okay if we follow up with you? So there are opportunities to follow up. But here's what I did to get around all that, is every week I'd go into the comments and, and I'd sort of been in an Excel spreadsheet and then I'd take all the detractors who had bad comments and I'd cut and paste the entire company thing into the system I was using so the CSM saw it. So at least, they didn't have to say, hey, I saw your rating and, because then the user might be going, you know, seriously, why weren't you paying attention before I told you to pound Sam, mm -hmm. right? But going into the meeting knowing that could actually cause your behavior to be different or Imagine support picks up the phone and knows that Robert's pissed off, but he's just calling in with a how-to question. Simple question, but having that context. Oh, yeah. So that health score, whatever it is for your company, plus some of the, the results of this data become really important. And this is, you know, this feeds back to the master customer record as well, because everybody should be seeing that, not just the CSM, right? So I just mentioned CSAT. Um, most companies, I've always kind of did this with support. Um, I've had miscellaneous luck uh, having people really fill it out. In fact, in, in my last gig, we hardly had anybody fill it out. However, after six months of NPS, um, and I got all the tens after six months, uh, like 40% of them was like your support rocks. 
So I'm like, all right, now I'm here to do the CSAT. But you could think of, um, if you have a six week onboarding process, perfect trigger to have something happen where you wrap that piece of the customer life cycle up and a trigger goes out and somehow, whether it's automated or not, through a system like Sharisha's where you can put together your SAT stuff, how do we do on onboarding? How do we do in this integration thing? You know, we've been spent three months, you had an integration manager, whatever. So there's a lot of opportunities to actually get your voice to your customer very specific to the phase they're in, where NPS is just that big, broad, you know, it's not gonna change overnight. It's just not, it's just not, it takes time. But, you know, companies who get it up above 50 plus, you know, they're, they're doing a lot right. And the data speaks for itself, especially as you get thousands and thousands of pieces of feedback over time. I actually met a CEO recently who had his admin call a few customers randomly and talk about how the different departments uh, were performing. And then he uh, would share the, the survey results, right? Uh, with the with the rest of the company in the all hands, and that I thought was a truly a customer success culture, right? Because uh, the CEO would get the pulse of what the customers are feeling, which department is doing well, which is not, and I thought it was a great practice. So this customer churn feedback is again an interesting thing, you know. Customers will never tell you the true story of the job, right? So they all, I'll just say it's not you, it's me. And you have to figure out, and this is very important feedback. If customers are churning, you want to know why this is happening. And so one thing that I we regularly encourage our customers to do is to dig deeper of why customers are churning. So I mean, in, in month 11 with the renewals, not, the time to be asking that question, right? I mean, month 13 is where you're doing the analysis of, okay, what really happened? And it's month three or four where you should be going, okay, are they following this path that we are confident will lead, you know, lead to success? And part of your churn playbook should be a categorization into a taxonomy of churn reasons. So at the end of the year, if you say, hey, we had 8% churn in terms of numbers of customer, not necessarily ARR, because it could have been above or below, you can come back to what were the systemic reasons? Was it product? Was it support? Was it the onboarding? Was it the, the value creation? So next slide is on the tools. So, um, a lot of tools that, are, that can be used for customer success. We actually put together a tools landscape, customer success technology landscape. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are customer success platform, customer relationship management, customer influencer, customer support, customer loyalty, customer ex uh, experience, and customer communication like people call, right? Mm -hmm. The various tools that fill the customer technology landscape. Just want to talk about the uh, customer success maturity framework. You know, if you look at how customers, uh, organizations can mature in terms of the framework, it's ad hoc, reactive, repeatable, proactive, and predictable. Right? So you, the eventual state is that you can predict which customer relationships are going downhill, and so that you can proactively then engage with the customers and bring it to a better state. Now, I've got next three slides that are, I can, the best way to describe is crowded, but it will give you a flavor uh, of, of what it means to do the journey map, map it to activity deliverables and to the final state, right? So you have this journey map that starts with uh, sales, engage, onboard, grow, advocacy, right? And then you figure out the teams that are doing that, right? This is where the sales, marketing, success all need to come together. You've got the touch point and what can be the scorecard, right? And where the customers get frustrated, we map that also. And then the recommendation that goes to metrics and what are the improvement opportunities. So this, if you translate it to activity deliverables, you can get to the details then. You know, here, here's what the internal activity is, the timeline and all of that, right? 
So when to do online with your community newsletter, reference program, all of that. And then you can then map it to the third stage where what are the documents, content. You asked, your first question was what documents you need to focus. So, you know, you need to initial focus on your initial phase and then move on. Any thoughts on the three slides? Does it give you that perspective of, you know, how do you start with the journey map, focus on the activity and then on the documents? And then our last slide is don't worry about competition, focus on the customer day and night, do well in the customer success. So what I would need is, uh, need the email address uh, for me to provide access to that folder so that you have all the documents. So my email is uh, Shreesha at strikedeck.com. So it's S H R E E S H A at strike deck, S T R I K E B C K dot com. We can just here. So if you can email me, then I'll, uh, it's a Google folder, I'll, uh, you know, provide you the access for the collaterals. Any questions for me and Mark on the phone? Are our phone friends still there? They need it. They need it? No, uh, yeah, we got a couple of them on the um, I had one question about customer advocacy. I think um, in terms of uh, with one of the very first slides you had, um, obviously word of mouth is going to be the best thing. It probably should happen naturally, but I'm curious if you've seen ways to nudge them a little bit more systematically. So it's not top of their mind to be talking about your product. I on the incentives or referrals, like. I, I it, um, I, mean, I wish Minnie was here because I know marketing folks and Teresha can chime in as a marketing guru, which I am not. Um, but I think, you know, this is where having CSM so you can train people around this. It isn't have to be an innate thing is, you know, pay attention. If you got this customer who's just like going nuts over the goodness you're providing them, it's okay to ask, would you, you know, I, I know you have to check with legal and marketing, but you just told me the greatest story that would be so awesome to share with the rest of our customers. Would you be willing to do that? Because I'll tell you, nine times out of 10, the people in the trenches that you're working with will say, absolutely. Where it gets shut down in big logo companies is, well, we don't allow you to do that. But it's just like paying attention to the upsell. There's no reason why you can't ask and train people to ask yeah. kind of a simple, innocent question yeah. in, a, in an advisory sort of way where you're not like, well, let me put my CMO in touch with you because they're going to swoop in. Will you do a paper? Will you talk to Gartner? Will you do a webinar? Will you do this? And they're like, oh God, I wish I wouldn't have started this one, right? Yeah. Where a CSM could just intelligently know that, you know, we've got a user conference coming up and if they, if, you know, I'm talking to somebody, if they spoke, that would be awesome. Or you know, this is a case study that's just like the perfect customer, you know, would they allow you to document it? I mean, it's not brain surgery, yeah. you know, it's just remember as a customer, how you feel when people swoop in and do those things. So you kind of back up and go, if I was in that slot, mm -hmm. you know, when I have my Zoom person call me and go, Mark, you know, because I'm always telling her, oh, this, you know, I've had problems, but overall it's been great, right? I'd give them a total 10 on their NPS score hands down, I don't care if I had a problem yesterday. But she has no problem as I'm being successful saying, would you mind introducing me to the IT people or would you mind getting on the line with the prospect with me? I guarantee it'll be less than 10 minutes. Absolutely, Brianna, not a problem. Yeah. And I think you can, you can train your CSMs to have those questions in their toolkit. Yeah. Same with sales. You don't have to be a salesperson doing a demo and giving a, 
value proposition to it. You just need to take the customer situation and go, oh yeah, you can do that, yeah. right? And just remember, you're that customer advocate and you're just shooting to help them get to that outcome. And you'd be surprised how, you know, how far you can get with that. I'll give you a couple of practices that I've seen works uh, really well. Mm -hmm. One is um, when a customer gives you an NPS score of nine or 10, uh, we had an instance where a customer did an immediate pop out saying, we are providing hundred bucks Amazon gift card. Mm -hmm. If you give us uh, two references right now. Yeah. And they also did an AB test with follow-up email a week later. So the, the response in the case of an immediate pop-out mm -hmm. was much greater than that email response. Mm -hmm. So one is, you know, whenever a customer indicates that he or she is happy, yeah. so some sort of promotion mm -hmm. will work really well, mm -hmm. right? That's one. Second is uh, the customers also want to be in line like if you can talk about how they can improve their online reputation when they are featured in a webinar or in an event, that will work really well as well. Mm -hmm. So allow them to be in the limelight mm -hmm. and you will get your required testimonial, your study, all of that. Um, and, and the smaller, you know, if I don't know what your customer base looks like, but if you're dealing with the Cisco's and General Motors, you're going to hit all kinds of bureaucratic red tape. But if you're dealing with a venture funded startup, mm -hmm. people love to talk about what they're doing, love to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you search for it, you'll find I did a whole video interview testimonial with Akamai. I mean, Akamai was this massive, big public company, and we were this little $6 million a year, but I had done some really cool stuff and it reduced my costs. and you know, and, and I could tell a great story that was engaging and they're like, and they brought in a whole film crew. I mean, yeah, a whole yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. And it was on the front of their website. And so, you know, people are like, who's except software? Well, you know, it was a good story. Mm -hmm. People love to do that. And CSMs are in the perfect spot to capture that. Yeah. Way more than, hi, I'm the marketing person. And yeah, here's yeah. my list of things my manager wants to do, mm -hmm. you know, in the next six months. What are you going to sign up for? And then it's like, that's it. You know, I mean, personally, it's a different people buy from people. You know, we, we, we're not in a, unless you're just in this completely devoid of human interaction, um, people interact and buy with people, especially in the B2B world, you know, connecting to that means a lot out of it. So the other thing I, I want to mention is that in large organization, they have internal awards. Right, so if you can help your uh, key sponsor win an award, that goes a long way. Oh, so yeah. we did that with uh, a large uh, uh, enterprise company. We helped our customer John win an innovation award, and then he was always available for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in large companies, you can ask whether there is any any award and how can you help uh, in them winning the award. Great, so any feedback about, about the content that we shared? I found it tremendously useful. Um, granted, I am newer to this and, and we're starting it out um, very early in our company. So a lot of this is very practical. And so really appreciate the time from both of you guys. Great, what was your company name again? Zugata. That's right, Zugata. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you guys have any time, any questions, let me know. Both Mark and I know, and uh, uh, if you need any other collateral, let us know as well. Okay. Mm -hmm.